Good morning, everyone. I, Shruti Anand from TY Life Sciences, will be your host for the day. On behalf of the Department of Life Sciences, I am delighted to welcome you all today. This session is being conducted by our departmental society, IRIS, and to tell you more about it, I would like to show you all a video. In India, talking about sexual and reproductive health has always been considered a taboo, due to which certain avoidable disorders or issues end up causing damaging effects to an individual. Now, the lack of awareness and spaces to talk safely about sexual issues can be mentally and physically deteriorating. One such issue is infertility, which is heavily looked down upon by our society. In fact, according to the Indian Society of Assisted Reproduction, Complications related to fertility affects about 10 to 14 percent of the Indian population, with higher rates in urban areas where one out of six couples is impacted. Nearly 27.5 million couples actively trying to conceive suffer from infertility in India. But with the recent developments in the field of medical sciences, assisted reproductive technology or ARD is one such route that people with fertility related issues can seek help from not just heterosexual individuals, but people from the LGBTQIA plus community can also seek benefits from the same. So this session is going to be all about ART and the different forms of treatment that it offers, such as in vitro fertilization or IVF, followed by a vir virtual tour of an IVF lab to understand the practical aspects of the treatment. Now, before we begin the session, I would like to thank our principal, Dr. Ashok Vatya sir, for being a constant support system and an absolute ray of sunshine for us. We have the honor of having him here with us today. So, would you like to say a few words? Thank you very much, uh, Shruti. Uh, your speech itself is like your name, you know, Anand, you know, which is giving happiness. And uh, we have here uh, Dr. K. S. Awari, actually, the particular issue which is going to address will bring the happiness in the woman's life wherever the problem of the fertility is involved. So I'm very glad that the life science has selected this particular topic, which is very apt because, as you said, it's a taboo. Of course, there are many things which are there that women giving birth to the girl child is also the taboo. Still, you'll find that the you know people do not accept and not, not aware, though we say that the science has progressed and we talk about X and Y and all those kind of things, combinations. 
another problem is that if that is the woman is not able to conceive then the blame comes only on her so looking at all these kind of things you will find that it's very important that this myth which is there should be addressed and it is not only in the rural areas this kind of problem also you will find in the urban and uh, you know because society is such uh, whenever the problem is there they don't look at it from all the angles it is more easy to consider you know like say or put the blame and women has been target for long time so i'm glad that this particular topic has been considered of course it is it is not a something like a new science which has been practiced starting from dr induja who was in km hospital went to just low but it has progressed to the extent like uh, uh, very far and nowadays you will find that it has become fashion for this uh, film stars you know to have the babies surrogate mother maybe teller maid of course dr uh, kc will throw a lot more light on that how to make the teller maid babies and all that and maybe all these stars will definitely will approach him uh, on this lighter note but the thing is that i consider sincerely that there's a lot of learning and i know that from the life sciences many students actually join such kind of fertility units and uh, there are a lot of job, job opportunities over here and maybe they will continue to progress complete their masters phd's and will open up clinics and will join the clinics in this manner so this is another thing which we one has to look at it that students are getting better opportunities to experience something which otherwise is difficult so i congratulate the life science department uh for uh, taking up this issue and organizing this of course covid situation uh, looking at this uh, still getting sir on the online you know and uh, addressing this which wonderful thing and uh, my good friend kesi uh, is here so i'm very happy to see him okay so very nice of you to take time and to address our young students at such a short notice you know so thank you very much uh of course uh, cases association is also with the wife the life science department now with the daughter so he is he has been the family member and he continues to be the family member so glad to have you sir i think uh, that's good enough because all of us are uh, you know actually waiting to hear uh, dr kes and i must say nilofa ma'am as well as the entire unit shilata and everybody in the life science department have worked very hard and students benefit so that is how we can see the shruti is you know addressing this uh, in a very confident note so shruti thank you very much i think uh, it's over to you thank you thank you so much sir it was was definitely some wise words and really motivating in general to hear all about that you know because of this we get the opportunity to talk about certain things and also understand what all field of aspects do we have after after a bachelor's after our masters and so on so this is definitely one of those topics that is in the dire need to be spoken about and created awareness about so without wasting any more time i would like to introduce our speaker for today dr kc avad who is a practicing embryologist and is the founder and director of embryology academy for research and training ert he completed his masters and phd in reproductive endocrinology During his PhD tenure, he was awarded the Lady Tata Junior Fellowship. He also holds a postdoc degree in andro andrology. He specializes in human embryology and assisted reproductive technology, and also holds interest in application support and troubleshooting, cryobiology, electron microscopy, and cytology. Apart uh, apart from this, he teaches developmental biology at postgraduate and graduate levels to life sciences students. He is currently working as an application support specialist for ART, embryology, and cryobiology, and is the chief instructor in ART, training doctors all over the globe. We are really glad to have you with us today. So, without any further ado, I would like to call Dr. K. C. Avari to take over and enlighten us about ART, followed by a question and uh, question answer session. So, if you have any questions during the session, you can put it up in the Zoom chat or the YouTube live, and they will be answered. Over to you, sir. Good morning to one and all. 
Can I take over? Oh, she's talking. I guess so. Yeah. Okay, fine. Wait. She's telling me to take over. No. Yeah. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, sir. Fine. Perfect. Uh, very good morning to all of you. And thank you for your kind introduction. Thank you, Dr. Ashok Wadia, sir. Thank you for really your kind words. So it's a family being back with you once again. So at the very onset, I would like to thank you, sir, Principal Dr. Ashok Wadia, along with the head of the department, Life Sciences, Ms. Nilufo Kotwal, and her team, her colleagues in the department, young future embryologists, all working in tandem, and giving me the opportunity to present myself with you once again. So it's a pleasure being with young people, the younger generation, the future scientists in the reproductive field, because over the years, it always gives me a great pleasure to conduct webinars, meets, seminars, and to distribute knowledge. I always mean knowledge is for distribution. One should never store and keep the knowledge amidst the four portals of your heart chamber. It has to be distributed. So from the time, 21st March 1991, the day when I saw the first come under the microscope, I'm into this field. It's a long, exhaustive field, had its own ups and downs, crests and troughs. But now we are much more into a streamlining field, especially with the latest uh, ICMR guidelines that this opportunity is opened out to a large uh, pool of students. There are multiple avenues because people just have an apprehension that embryology only means working in a lab. There is a lot of research avenues there, stem cell, PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, genetics of implantation, biomedical culture media, biomedical optics. So there are the range is huge. So what I have tried to do in this webinar is to concise and amalgamate all the parameters which are essential in infertility, the reasons, the cures, the treatments, and their approaches. Though this can run for days together. So what I did was also in this COVID time, since it would have been difficult for the students to visit the lab. Intentionally, we have done small clippings in our laboratory. Remember, this is a training laboratory. And whatever I will be showing you is not copy paste from any journals or guidelines or books, but the actual nuances which a budding embryologist has to encounter, has to face in the laboratory. Question and answers are open. My email, I will share it with you. Anything extra, 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 please feel free to ask me. So now I think we rock and roll. I'm sharing my screen and starting my presentation. Am I okay? Audible? Thank you. Yeah. Visibility okay? Audio okay? Perfect. Yeah. So we start. Infertility and enigma. Well, this is a phenomena which many a young couple face. And to make it worse, this is considered as a curse, a stigma on the couple, or as if they are treated as if they are committed to a crime for which they were inadvertently not responsible. Infertile couples are always looked down. Now, let me give you an example. Suppose we attended a wedding of a close friend or a relative six months back. Subsequently, we meet them. What's the first question we ask them? Is there any good news? Right? And the moment they say no, we look at them with such an awe that as if they have committed a crime akin to murder. So this is that barrier which is there, that psychosomatic stress barrier, that apprehension. It is like we are invading their privacy. We are invading their ethical rights. Now, this is exactly what was preventing till today many a young couple from approaching help for infertility. 
because they were too shy. They were aware of the social stigma. What people would say, oh my God, such a young age, you are going for infertility. But now the shackles are broken. Mindsets are open. People have become a little broad-minded. There is galloping progress in technology, medications, biomedical research, biosciences, life sciences. And we are nearly at a stage of literally conquering infertility. Though I repeat, none of the procedures in infertility guarantee you 100% success. What we are trying to do in these procedures are, we are enhancing your success. Right? So with that, we start. And this is the first slide. Well, a disease of the reproductive system defined by failure to achieve a clinical pregnancy after 12 months or more of regular unprotected sexual intercourse. Now here I have purposely omitted the word married couples because, well, it is depending upon the geographical location, how you consider it, right? Two types, primary and secondary infertility. Primary means the couple never has a child. And secondary, well, they have one child and then subsequently in the new era of time, because of multiple peripheral factors, they are not able to conceive subsequently. Initially, it was thought infertility means blame the female, period. That's it. The male is always right. There's nothing wrong with him. Many a times we have found that on numerous occasions, the female is tortured to a battery of tests, hormonal investigations, scopies, etc., etc., only to find at the end of the day that the male is azoospomic. Well, mm -hmm. avenues are opening, tests are opening, technology for de de detection of hormones, etc., etc., as we rightly heard designer baby's concepts are also coming in. But that's a distance too far. There is quite a distance between the cup and the lip as far as us prodding into that. So my basic for all students, entrants, new embryologists, please learn the basics first. It will literally help you stem the tide over. Male infertility today is galloping. We are at par in certain sectors, in certain areas. Male fertility women dominate so. So this is exactly, as per the World Health Organization, basic causes. But today, infertility is affecting men and women equally. They may be having primary, secondary, or psychosexual disorders. Absolutely normal in all the concepts, but psychosomatically, they are stressed out. So unfortunately, every sexual act doesn't occur or result into a conception. Okay. A pie chart showing different causes and the percentages. Now, many a times you always see this big chunk, unexplained. People debate whether it is unexplained or whether it is undetected. Because remember, we are dealing in embryology, which is a subset of infertility with two cells of the body. The largest cell, which is the oocyte and the most sensitive cell and the most tiny and the most motile cell of the body, that's the sperm. It's their fusion. And it's not like you keep an egg and you keep a sperm and ultimately what you see is an embryo. No, there are certain chemical procedures. They have to be primed. So this is where the laboratory concept comes into play because in embryology, what we are doing is we are exactly mimicking the vivo conditions into vitro. And the ideal success is a take-home baby rate. We know that after a procedure, we do a pregnancy test, we do a beta HCG test, then we have to repeat the test after two weeks, see a quantum increase in the level, then we see a cardiac activity, and then ultimately a take-home baby rate. Now, it is not all that rosy or it is all not that smooth, which looks like. There are a number of steps and hiccups. There are abortion rates, quite high miscarriages because remember at the back of your mind these couples had a tough time conceiving on their own so it is all by our exogenous inputs that we are trying it's not like we are whipping a dead horse no no it's not like that but of course the horse is not all that stable as it how it should have been so these are the challenges which lie so therefore embryology is an amalgamation of all the subjects male and female infertility endocrinology the laboratory part, 
the gadgetry part, the QAQC, the quality control, the media, the disposables, the skill, the techniques, the hormones, etc., etc. Therefore, it is completely coming under the umbrella of biotechnology and life sciences. So we are all contributing. And believe me, in ART, the contribution of life science and biotechnology is as high as 90 to 95%. Now, thanks to the uninterrupted and magnificent efforts by Dr. Robert Edwards and Dr. Steptoe, they were the ones who actually gave us the first IVF baby. This is about a time brief, Louis Brown. Now she herself has become a mom. So well, the system works. Generations are slowly going on without any hassle. Because they always say that whenever we do ART, are we compromising with the genetic structure to a little bit? Well, a little bit of yes and a little bit of no, depending upon how exactly the procedure has gone ahead. Then this is also the first ice baby, frozen embryo. Okay, so this comes under the subset of cryobiology. Now, these are the achievements in ART. First IVF baby, first intracytoplasmic sperm injection baby, first IUI pregnancy. You can see this date. Phenomenal. Okay, first frozen thaw baby. So these are all the milestones which were achieved. Because gradually, 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 this process also evolved. As more and more investigations into the human body, the anatomical part, the microscopical anatomy, the electron microscopy, the structure, the secretions, all these well modulated together is a success in embryology. So as I told you, two cellular entities, the sperm and the oocyte, this oocyte is a well matured metaphase two with an extended polar body. And this is the pattern of sperm. This is progressive because it travels quite straight. This is non-progressive, the subsequent breakups, which I will tackle in this issue. Now, when we handle the two gametes, well, we have to culture them from vivo to vitro. It's not all that easy, nor it's difficult. But in culturing sperm, well, procurement and analysis is comparatively easy compared to the female, where we have to interventionally do an ovum pickup. So this is a little bit of medical expertise. Then in both, we culture them, we capacitate them, we prime them, and subsequently we select a sperm. Whereas in an oocyte, what we are doing is we cannot bank on a single one or two oocytes which are regularly produced. So what we do, we stimulate the ovaries. We take the process of oogenesis into our control. We prime them with hormones in a regulated pattern, which is known as hormonal protocols. Then we monitor the growth. How? Well, we can't put a probe inside the body. So what we do is ultrasonography. And the sonography, which leads to or caters to the art of monitoring or regulating the growth of the follicles is known as folliculogenesis. Then comes the process of oocyte retrieval, or what we call it as oom pickup, from the ovaries into the laboratory. And then starts the culture process. So embryology can be termed as a fence. The two sides are the clinical side, which a gynecologist or an infertility specialist handles, and the other side is the embryologist handling. So the gynec is responsible for recruiting the patient, monitoring the patient, charging the stimulation, doing the pickup, and providing ideal gametes to the other side of the fence that's in the laboratory, the oocyte and the sperm. Post formation of your embryo or your blastocyst, whether on day three or day five, it is returned back from where it came from. So that is the embryo transfer. So we are transferring the cultured embryos of a selected age into a well-primed endometrium that is the ovary in the, I'm sorry, in the uterus, which again is a skill of the gynecologist. So this is an amalgamation of various steps put together, which takes deep, meticulous, dexterity at work, and of course, awareness and knowledge. So we tackle the first part, the male part, the gamete, that's the sperm. We all know common definition, head, mid-piece and tail, 
three parts. Each is contributing to one factor. But for the proper ideal functional concept of the sperm, we need all of them to maintain in a nice collective manner. So the total orientation, the total structural integrity, the functional integrity, the chemical integrity of all the three parts should work in tandem in order to make the sperm a most viable gamete. Take an example. Head is there, the acrosome, oh, genetic material. But what makes this genetic material go all the way from the vagina, cervical canal, external loss, internal loss, body of the uterus tubes? Motility. How are they motile? Well, we have a tail, which we plashes, effective stroke, recovery stroke, and it propels further. From where the hell do they get the energy? They get the energy from the mitochondria, ATP. So this is how the whole structure works in unison. Now, as per the strict criteria, now strict criteria was devised by two African scientists, Dr. Daniel Franken and Dr. Thinnes Tuber, pioneers in the field of andrology. And this is WHO criteria, which is quite the same. So we, of course, as usual, they target the head part, the head length with the acrosome, the midpiece and the tail. So this is known as a collective comprehensive morphology of a sperm. Now, usually in embryology, what we are doing is, in majority of the cases, we are just doing morphometry. We are studying the shape, the size, the development pattern. Unfortunately, there is no marker test of a biochemical or a mall biological, which will help us detect okay, this is the best sperm, this is the best two site, and this is the best embryo. So we have to go along with the set guidelines of standardized pattern. Because what in a sperm we are targeting is that intactness and the non-compromised sperm DNA. Because the mammalian sperm, the DNA is packed multiple times in the acrosome tight. Okay, so when it enters the oocyte, it decondenses or it ruptures then starts the fusion of the two. Now, how will they start? Unless and until both the gametes are primed chemically to their ideal state of activation or what I would say as hyperactivation, this process can't be achieved. So, what is necessary? Well, your hormones, male hormone, testosterone, which is produced by the body itself, pituitary gonadotropins, FSH and LH, now, these gonadotropins or gonad they are gonadotrophic hormones. Fic means what? Acting at a site. They are controlled by gonadotropic hormone releasing factors from the hypothalamus. So, hypothalamus triggers the pituitary, pituitary targets the particular cell. The cell produces extra indigenous localized hormones, and the whole system is functional. So, there are trophic hormones at the same time that are endogenously produced body hormones to control and regulate the proceedings. Now this is in a nutshell, a general hormonal control in the males, hypothalamus produces and targets the anterior pituitary, FSH targets the sertoli cells and facilitates spermatogenesis, LH targets the Leydig cells or the interstitial cells because seminiferous tubules are bounded by a blood testis barrier. No blood directly mixes with them. It is the 5-alpha dihydrotestosterone which targets the seminiferous tubules, which nurses the sertoli cells, which forms the spermatogenesis. Now the endogenous hormones testosterone which is produced is good as well as bad. Why bad? If in excess. The Leydig cells stimulate the sertoli cells. Extra testosterone acts as a negative feedback on the pituitary and hypothalamus. Please control your secretion. My circulating body level is quite high. Because in any hormone, what we study is the half-life and the circulating body levels. 
Initially, when we take injections of testosterone, enanthet, or any other esters like propionate or didaconate, our spermatogenesis will be pepped up. It's a boost. But if in excess, it targets the pituitary, stops the suppression. So those bodybuilders, weightlifting champions, if at all, they were on high levels of steroids in their youth, well, the muscle mass develops, no doubts about it. But at the same time, they were unaware of the other drastic effect of testosterone, which has compromised the secretory activity of the testes. So this is also one of the reasons for male infertility. Now, this is, these are the stages of input, I mean, spermatogenesis. 70 days approximately is the cycle length. So from spermatogonia A to B, spermatocytes primary, secondary, three stages of spermatids, early phase, cap phase, maturation phase, and ultimately this formation of the spermatozoa. Now, this will help you understand proper the tubule, this germinal epithelium. In any adult, puberty sets in. Why puberty sets in? The axis is activated. Along with that, peripheral sexual characteristics start developing, facial hair, hoarseness of the moist, the musculature. And cell-wise, you see the cells germinating. It's like I am watering a bed. The main plants will start germinating. So here, what is the water? Of a pituitary hormones. So many a times when there is precocious puberty, when there is delayed puberty, there is a disarray or a mess up in the pattern of hormone regulation. Now, this is exactly the cytology when studied, the lumen where the sperm are released, and this is how this process takes place with reference to meiosis, mitosis, and how the division takes place and ultimately spermiation takes place. Now, this is a simple definition. Spermatogenesis, different steps by which spermatogonia are transferred into spermatozoa in the testes, onset from puberty, and it continues till old age. A man will keep on producing sperm. Howsoever pathetic or non-functional or residual, the process will keep on going on and on. But these are the two subsets, spermiogenesis and spermiation. Now, spermiogenesis is what? Spermatids into spermatozoa. And spermiation means actual release into the lumen. Now, I target the female gamete. That's the oocyte. Now, why is a female anatomy or the female to be discussed or dealt with in details? She has a number of functions to do. She produces a oocyte, which is a gamete. She accepts the male oocyte, the male sperm. In the body, the sperm travel all the way. Cervix, vagina, internal loss, external loss, canals, all the way into the tubes. So there is a travel pattern. They nestle there. The oocyte is ruptured. The oocyte is fertilized. Embryo is formed. Embryo travels all the way from the tubes, nestles here, denudes, implants. The gestation starts. She has to maintain the child, nine months of gestation, flawless. She has to subsequently deliver the child. So you see, there are a lot of areas where complications might take place. Right from that time in the ovary where the follicles are formed, the way they grow, the way they are ruptured, the way they are caught in the tubes. So all the anatomical issues are also of vital importance. Whereas fortunately, in a male, he just produces male gametes, releases them, job done. So this is an oocyte. When we see post pickup, this is what we will observe. This is a lovely oocyte cumulus complex, as you will observe under the stereosome microscope. This is the oocyte, and these are the cumulus cells. On higher magnification, this is how we will see. And once we remove this cumulus cell, this is what we see. And this is the extrusion of the polar body, which is a mature oocyte capable of fertilization. 
So when we are priming a lady, we target a maximum recovery of at least 10 to 14 OCCs, USAID cumulus complex, out of which 80% should be metaphase 2 or mature. So this challenge will lie on the infertility specialist, especially the gynecologist, where she will recruit the patient, monitor the patient, patient selection, dose selection, and thereby starting the cycle of slowly, slowly priming her, monitoring her folliculogenesis, enzymes, hormones, till the day of the ovum pickup. Now, we just study this female system. Okay. Frontal view, side view. The vaginal opening. Okay. Extends all the way inside. The os. External os. Then here, the internal os. All the way into the cavity of the uterus. Now, uterus nestles under the bladder. So what the sperm has to do, the sperm have to travel all the way from here uninterruptedly over here. So frontal side would be better to observe. It goes here, goes here, travels all the way from the tubes, nestles over here, the egg ruptures, the fuse over here. So the whole complex has to be functioning spotlessly. There shouldn't be a flaw anywhere. So if there are cervical issues, if there are endometrial issues, if there are tubal issues, if there are follicular issues, the cycle will be compromised. Now, we take a cross section of the ovary, the female gonad producing <coughs> organ. What we see is number of follicles in the various stages the primordial, the pre primordial, the developing follicle, the secondary follicle, the antrum follicle, and the graftian follicle which ultimately will be ruptured. And this is under the hormonal control. So this is hormonal control or endocrinological control of female reproduction. Now, when I take a section, hematoxylin eosin stain slide, I would see what? A number of follicles, all in various stages, about to rupture. Now, this is a very important criteria to note because one of the reasons of female infertility is poor ovarian reserve. So if your original reserve of oocytes is poor, obviously in a procedure, the recruitment will be compromised. So you won't get good stuff to work with or it is not a, it won't be a challenge because what we want is both quality as well as quantity. Now, this is to just explain to you how the follicle maturation takes place from primordial, primary, secondary. Then as the fecal cells keep on adding, it forms the antrum cavity, here the follicle fluid, and there starts the follicle development attached over here, cumulus euphorus, and ultimately it ruptures. This is the text version, and this is how your cytological version, how ultimately subjected to various procedures of mitosis and meiosis, you get a good metaphase to mature follicle. Now, just like in a male, the axis also exists in a female. The same hormones, FSH and LH, target the ovary. So the follicles which were hidden then small, when they are irrigated by FSH, they start growing. And when they start growing, there are extra layers of fecal cells which are being added to them and they become their endogenous endocrine organ and they start secreting estrogen. Now this estrogen and all will also be giving a negative feedback to the pituitary. If more is there, please control. And at the same time, they will target the uterus for development, thinking that maybe the conceptus will be forming. If not, no fertilization, the oocyte is flushed out into what we call it as your flow during your periods. Okay? Now, this is a detailed version. 
how the mature follicle or the graphene follicle is targeted. So there is an LH surge. When the LH surge takes place, the follicle ruptures. This is how your oocyte development is there, right from oogonia, primordial, primary and secondary. Now, this is the pre-antral phase and the male antral phase is tertiary phase when it actually starts developing and there you see the formation of an oocyte inside. Now, in an ART cycle, we are cutting off the pituitary supply of gonadotropins. So, the ovaries become redundant bags and then we start exogenously giving the female injections of FSH and we control the whole process of folliculogenesis, which we monitor by ultrasonography and do the final procedure of pickup where we are harvesting the eggs from vivo to vitro. Now, this is a magnified version. This is a graphene follicle about to rupture. This is the OM. These are the cumulus ufora cells which are just connecting this. So when the egg ruptures, what happens? This connectivity breaks from here. And this is liberated out. So these are the different layers, theca interna, theca externa. And they are the ones which secrete estradiol or actually estrogen. A derivative of estrogen is estradiol. Now, hormone levels are very much important. In the developmental phase or the first follicular phase, FSH is very much essential. Then there is what we call it as an LH surge. Now, this LH surge indicates that you are going to ovulate. So, when you are going to ovulate, there are many body changes which take place. Your basal body temperature rises your mucus secretion increases. So that's a totally different topic on cervical mucus secretion. Now, why does the mucus secretion increase? It anticipates the arrival of the sperm. So in the ovulatory phase, 13, 14, and 15, you are the most fertile at that time. After which it crashes down and this part shrinks and it forms corpus luteum and ultimately corpus albicans. It is reabsorbed by the ovarian stroma. Now, this is what we call as the LH surge and the most fertile days. So whenever we were priming the ladies and telling them for timed intercourse, one cycle was studied beforehand and later on, she was told to have relations on these two days where the LH surge is at the max. Nowadays, we have got ready-made LH kits by which we can just check the urine and see the peak LH activity. So what we were able to do is we were just trying to help the lady with those two or three possible days wherein her chances of conception were quite high. Now for developmental biology, well, the derms, you know, there are three derms, ecto, meso, endo, somatoplores, flacnoplor. Now from this, cells originate, cells migrate, invaginate, accumulate, organogenesis. So for gametes, endoderm and mesoderm are the two vital layers. Okay. <clears throat> now subsequently, what happens on what develops from which it's mentioned over here. Now, I go back to male infertility. So we have had a small idea about the male gametes. We had a brief idea about the female gametes. We studied a little bit of their endocrinological regulation. So anytime the first thing which a lady is subjected to is an abdominal sonography or an intravaginal sonography to see the condition of her ovary, to see the condition of her uterus, hormone levels at various phases, menstruating, pre-menstruating, post-menstruating, FSH, LH, prolactin, because hypersecretion of certain hormones also lead to permanent suppression and infertility. The same goes for males also. <clears throat> now, in a male, there are two types of dysfunctions, spermatogenic and erectile dysfunction. A person or a male having problems with spermatogenesis because spermatogenesis and erection or erectile issues are absolutely two different things. 
a gentleman having an erection doesn't mean that he is fertile. And a gentleman who doesn't have an erection doesn't mean he is infertile. A gentleman who has poor spermatogenesis, but the erectile function is excellent. The joy of sex can be obtained, but ultimately, pregnancy will be doubtful. Whereas in this case, spermatogenesis is function, perfect. Sperms are produced by the tons, but modus operandi is absent. So this is more like a psychosomatic stress, apprehensions, turn-offs, overwhelming demands. Okay. So this needs a proper caring from what we call it as psychiatrists, andrologists. It may need certain medical therapy. It may need counseling. And most important is it needs is reassurance. In infertility, you tell a person, you reassure a person, because many times it used to happen in the andrology lab, a gentleman just couldn't collect him and used to come shivering. Sir, kya karo I will listen. It is not the beginning of the third world war. You can go home, have a collection, because who knows, you might be having an anxiety, suddenly collecting in a lab, our overwhelming demand, please collect properly, the wife has a cycle to do, don't fail her off, you know, that sort of the stressing of an individual. I'm sure we as students, when we, used to, when we are still approaching for examinations and we enter the examination hall, they say a multitude of thoughts. Some say, well, question to bilkul aega. And all you know, you have omitted that question. But this chapter is very important. Majority of the questions will be coming from this chapter. Then you say, oh shit, I have omitted this whole chapter. Now what to do? So, you know, these are what it is, over demanding approach. And plus, that apprehension you say, hey, oh my gosh, I am going to fail in this paper. That's for sure. The same thing is the same. If by unfortunate means a counselor hasn't counseled the couple properly and so, oh my gosh, sir, the report is very bad. The gentleman will have a doubt for the rest of his life that he is never able going to give a good collection of sperm. So what we got to do is counseling is very important where we have got to remove the apprehensions. Now, Male, in, male fertility is a complex issue. What is exactly expected? Produce sperm. Sperm should be carried to the semen. Now there is a pathway. Testes, epididymis, cords, accessory glands, and the ejaculate. Now again, a problem in this, there could be an obstruction. So pathway should be smooth. Quantity and quality. Sperm may be 80 million. Motility is excellent, only to find out the gentleman is severely diabetic. The fertilization will not be there. So this is what we want to know is we have to go to the grassroots levels. We have to understand the patient's history, old history, current history. These are the medical causes. And these are the environmental causes. Now, Lifestyle today is synonymous with any goddamn disease. You have this, improve your lifestyle. Agreed. But, well, the effect or the don't effect, we really don't know. But these environmental causes, especially X-ray radiation, heavy metal exposure, you won't believe. Many a times the milk which we drink, these bhaiyas and all, sometimes what they do, they inject the cattle with oxytocin injections to improve the blood flow, I mean the milk flow. The same milk which we drink, the oxytocin levels get into our body and they also cause suppression. So these are inadvertent causes which we haven't even thought about. So these are the causes percentage wise. Okay. Now, another ones. Now, what's the difference block? Now, this is the testes, the production site. Caput, corpus, cauda. Caput is a place where the sperm are matured. Action with the enzymes. Lactate dehydrogenase, sorbitol dehydrogenase, alkaline phosphatase, glycerophosphatin colonies. Then they come and they collect in the cauda. So cauda is a storage. Then they travel through those long cords, what we call as vas deferens, come into the complex and then they are ejaculated outside. 
Now, if there is a problem in the cords or there is a blockage, the supply is stopped. So this is what we call it as obstructive azoospermia. Sperm are produced, but there is an obstruction. Okay. Then varicocele. People sitting cross-legged for hours together with hot computers or laptops on their laps or rickshaw drivers or auto drivers continuously sitting on the hot engine or just for the page three effect, those striped underwears with the tight skin fitting jeans. What it does is the testicles are basically compacted to the skin, to the body cavity. And usually testes are in the scrotal sac. Why? Because the temperature of their optimal functioning is 1 to 1.5 degrees less, they want to be away. And here we are compacting them. So what does it do? Heat induction not only prevents good quality sperm, but also it swells up the veins, the spermatic artery and the vein. And there are your cords going simultaneously. So with the increasing or the thickening in the veins, the cords get compacted. So the sperm flow is obstructed. Then there are cases of undescended testes, what we call it as Wolfian ducts defects. The testes are just in the coelom. They are not descended down. So they are underdeveloped. Why underdeveloped? Because body temperature is high. Then many times gentlemen undergo vasectomy and then they say, nice sir, abhi mujhe reversal chahiye. What we call it is vasovasotomy. They are ligated back. But unfortunately, success is not all that high. Then there is varicocele. There is hydrocele fluid filling due to infection. There is orchitis, swelling of the epididymis. There are multiple reasons, but there are cures available provided detected at the right time. Then most important, production being excellent, ejaculatory disorders. And some, the highlighted ones are premature ejaculation, delayed ejaculation, retrograde, and end ejaculation. Now, in normal ejaculation, what happens? Ejection of sperm and seminal fluid during a male orgasm. So whenever there is an sexual act or when there is what we call it as the initial foreplay, it kneels into the sexual arousal and the response time. And these are the phases. The initial is the excitation phase. Then there is a slight plateau phase. Then the lubrication phase. Lubrication phase, of course, we are not in control of it. Our body glands anticipating the arrival of the sperm or the release of the sperm, we get ourselves lubricated. Now, in a gentleman, the first lubrication takes place because of the release of the secretion from the bulbourethral gland. Because in a male, the urine and the sperm are extruded out through the same opening, the penile opening. So, when the excitation phase starts, the Cowper's gland or the barbourethral glands, they compress and they give out slight micro quantity of a secretion, transparent, no sperm, acidic pH, which cleans the entire tract of old urine residue. Because urine is acidic, it can play havoc with the DNA of the sperm. Now, in a female, lubrication, how? The glands of Bartholins they secrete the wetness. At the same time, the uterine contractions take place. The mucus is there, anticipating the arrival of the sperm. Okay, now in a male, if the proper thing doesn't take place at a proper time, unfortunately, the system goes haywire. Like say this, premature ejaculation. You have an orgasm before intercourse or start or less than a minute after you start. There is no set time, but there has been research. How long should a man last before ejaculation? Research is how second it takes five to seven minutes for a normal ejaculatory mechanism. It may differ, but severe variations, the earlier it is bad. Now, this is also another interesting study, intravaginal ejaculatory time. If it is just less than a minute, well, it's premature ejaculation. Normal, 4 to 10 minutes, delayed, and any ejaculation means no semen produced. 
Okay. Now this is more into the ejaculatory disorders. Now this is delayed ejaculation. Now, an ejaculation or failure to produce semen. Correct? So an ejaculation or aspermia. And azoospermia means semen is there, but there are no sperm. So please, the nomenclature should be dealt with very carefully. Then there are other reasons. And most important, the genetic factors. Y chromosomal micro deletion, Klinefelter syndrome. These are the reasons. But unfortunately, in a genetic issue, it can't be helped. It is said that if Y chromosome micro deletion is there in a male, he fathers a child by ICSI, then the offspring being a male, he is sure to have the infertility problem. Reasons for female infertility. Well, as I told you, problems with ovulation, starting from the ovaries, damage to the tubes, the transit part, the uterus, the anchoring part, the cervix, the accepting part, plus the fluctuating hormones, which coincide with the age. Now today, unfortunately, people panic within two months of the marriage or 10 years after marriage. The between time they leave to God. And this is where they mess up that already good existing endocrine system because as time goes by, age is the biggest factor which proves to be an obstacle as far as quality gametes are concerned, especially in the female. Because everywhere there can be problems. Uterus can develop polyps, fibroids, septums, and adhesions. Tubes can be developing pelvic inflammatory disease or PIDs, chlamydia, gonorrhea infection, tubal factor, pox, ovulation, well, thyroid stress, pituitary tumors, Egg number, already the lady has a poor ovarian reserve or genetic chromosomal issue. There can be unexplained infertility for which you cannot pinpoint a direct cause. And there can be multifactorial infertility, whereas both the partners are affected. So it can be problem with the male, female is normal, problem with the female, male is normal, both are abnormal, both are normal but still psychosomatically stressed. Now, we always say that if I'm having an LH surge, I should always ovulate. No, that's not necessary. So your menstrual flow in the event of a failed fertilization doesn't mean that you have flushed off the ruptured leucite. All you know, you may be also suffering from LUFS, which is luteinized unruptured follicle syndrome. Correct? So the LH surge means that you will probably ovulate within the next 12 to 24 hours. If your cycle is irregular or you rarely or never get a menstrual cycle, then you have a problem with ovulation. There are cases. So I'm getting periods after two months. I have not got a period since six months. I'm having a very heavy flow. I'm having just a spotting. So this is all your initial diagnosis which a gynecologist or an infertility specialist will do. Because these are also other ovulation disorders. Now, ovulation disorders is with the irregular or erratic functioning of your reproductive hormones. So with any ovulation disorder, the first thing which will be messed up is the synchronicity of your menstrual cycle. Most common symptoms will be irregular absent periods, so the difficulty in becoming pregnant. Other reasons will be polycystic PCOS or a hormonal imbalance or primary ovarian insufficiency it means your ovary doesn't harbor the sufficient amount of the follicles which would have subsequently matured into good follicles. Now, age. Children, girls, young girls, when they are born, their ovaries are stocked with follicles. 
millions at times, drops down to this much at birth, till puberty. So see, there is a significant cascading effect. So fertility initially declines at age 27. Because why? Because you see the reduction in the number as age progresses. And at the same time, the ovarian reserve also gets depleted. Now, if there is a large 50% viable pool from that, literally 100% periovulatory follicles, these ones are viable. As age increases, the pool gets reduced. And even though this is there, the viability percent dips, dips further. So it is not that all the follicles which are cited on a follicular screen are all matured, excellent and ready to go. Because we really don't know what exists inside. An ultrasonography of an ovary will tell you or will show you the number of follicles but won't assure you whether the oocyte is present in it or not. Decline in fertility with increasing maternal age. Prevalence of genetically abnormal oocytes. Okay. What happens? Enuploides. Chromosomal number. These are very specific ovarian tests. The AMH, the enteral follicle count, the basal estradiol level, the BMI, FSH. So these are the primary hormones which are to be investigated in a female when she recruits herself for infertility. Now, this is what AMH does. I would like to highlight only on this. Younger, the units. Correct? Nanograms per millimoles. Now, today, it is very important that the levels of AMH will tell you the functioning capacity or the subsequent quality of your oocytes. Anovulation causes and premature ovarian failure. Now this is drastic, deadly. It is literally the failure of the ovary to produce good quality oocytes because of either autoimmune, genetic or idiopathic discrepancies. So pregnancy rate is pathetic. Now in this anovulation, well, hormone imbalance could be set right. Obesity could be controlled, anorexia nervosa, stress could be controlled, and a patient can be counseled properly. Now, when I just come across to the anatomical issues, you know, penile entry, deposition of the sperm, mixing of the sperm with the secretions, vehicle way, the sperm enter, 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 travel, 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 tubes, bingo, settle over here. So the tubes are in three parts, isthmus, ampulla, and infundibulum. When there is LH surge, this fimbria get activated, they trap the ovary, and from here there is a hyla, which will help you the rupture. The egg will rupture, it will be immediately caught up. The sperm have traveled all the way here, and have nestled over here. They meet the approaching egg, Conceptus takes place depending upon the environment of the tube. So number one, just like the vasa difference of the male, the tube should also be open. But remember, open tube doesn't mean a functional tube. Now, what is a functional tube? A tube from all these places has different cytoarchitecture. The secretory capacity is different at all the places. This is advantage we are taken when we are culturing our development media. So this area, the infundibulum, this is where zygote formation takes place. The fusion of the male and the female. Then it's slowly as it goes ahead, zygote formation, two cell, four cell. So here we are utilizing the cleavage media or the growth media. As we go further, morula, compaction. So this is advanced growth media. So what we are doing is we are literally mimicking the human body. So merely the open tube doesn't mean it is excellent as far as the secretory capacity is concerned. Now, 
What are the diseases which affect the tubes? There are chlamydia infections, bacteria. Now this is your cervix, which is normal, the cervical opening or the os. And this is when you have a chlamydial infection. It is totally grotesque looking, swollen, infected. Okay, symptoms, pus like discharge, painful urination, spotting, bleeding, and the refracted pain, rectal pain, bleeding or discharge. Now, how are we to test whether the tube is functional or not? What we do is a hysterosalpingography test, which is very simple. An iodine-based dye is injected to the cervix at the same time, continuously the x-rays are being taken. So any abnormal shape or structure, an injury or a trauma, adhesion, polyp, or any foreign body or a pistule going in the uterus will be immediately detected. This is how it will be done. The dye is injected. Here the dye spins are beautifully, so the tube is completely open. Here there is an obstruction, so the tube, the, the dye doesn't come out. And this is exactly how the radio contrast dye is seen. Now you see over here, the spillage. Okay. This is the first investigative uh, this, uh, test which a gynecologist will do. But at the same time, remember, open tube is not a functional tube. Remember that in mind also. Then there is an, another infection, what we term as hydrosalpins. Hydro means filling with water, post-contamination post or infection. Depends upon what time and when it is detected. If it is extremely bad, unfortunately, surgery or the removal of the tube is the only option. Then, subsequently, there can be a scar tissue or there are adhesions which are left. Even that can inadvertently affect the infertility. So, proper investigation, anatomical, hormonal, is very important before we, in a haste, rope in a, rope in a couple for a cycle. Now, this is your hydrosalpins, the infected tubes. This is actually the uterus. This is your tube. This is the ovary, and this is the swollen tube. See, right hydrosalping, this is how it is seen on a sonography or an x ray. Correct? Then, your diagnostic findings. Because the inside lining of the fallopian tube may be damaged. Even though the liquid flows through the soil, then the inside lining is damaged. You know, there is one more very important structure present in the tube. It's the cilia. And the cilia always have that lovely wavy motion. So what they try to do? The conceptus, which is found in the fimbria, are slowly passed on all the way through the tubes and they come and nestle into the uterine cavity. If the cilia are affected, your embryo is not transferred outside. What happens? Your conceptus will start growing in the fallopian tube itself to a certain extent. And then the lady will start showing or signs of symptoms. Pain in the abdomen, beta HCG positive, missed period is the first sign of an ectopic pregnancy. So ectopic pregnancy means a pregnancy which has taken place not in the uterus, but in the tubes. If detected early, well, you can be flushed it out. Or if it is late, unfortunately, tubectomy. Now, certain block tubes, adhesions, biocannulization, cutting of the infected part and ligating them back, now there are fibroids. Uterine fibroids are non-cancerous growths of uterus. Sometimes they are known as lyomas. Whereas polyps, polyps occur at various places. They are just like an overgrowth of cells in the lining of the endometrium or the uterus. So there can be uterine polyps and they can be endometrial polyps. So this is it. 
where it occurs. If they are inside, they compromise the space and they prevent the development or they prevent the anchorage of the embryo into the endometrium. Depends upon the area. Subserosal, quite outside, intramural, inside the thick muscular wall. Slightly it penetrates. Okay. Pedunculated outside. Pedunculated inside, it hangs like a pendulum. Now, this is the most nasty form. And this is how your fibroid uterus will be looking like. Now, as per the FIGO, Federation of International Gynecologists and Obstetricians, where they are situated, this is not for exactly for students, it's for advanced gynec uh, USG intervention. But this is the time or this is the area, localized area. One, two, three, four. Now here we'll see this. Yeah, that will be fine. Where the placements are. Okay. Now this is a nice observation. Ultrasonography. This is your uterus. This is your endometrium. This is your endometrium cavity. This is the cervix and this will be your vagina. So the passage is from here to here. Now here you see this dark mass. This is a fibroid. Look over here. Exactly in the center of the uterine cavity. How the blob is seen. This is it. So this is it over here. So initially the situation, the intensity, or what we call it is the density and the size plays a very important part because this is the place where your subsequent embryo is going to implant and it is going to mature for the next eight to nine months prior to a normal delivery. So any obstruction physically or chemically can compromise with the developmental pattern. Then there are Mullerian duct defects, as I said. In a testis, when they are not descended well, they remain in the coelom. Because for spermatogenesis, remember, testes need body temperature 1 to 1.5 degrees less than the coelom temperature. The reason is they want to protect the integrity of the developing DNA. But there is just one terrestrial mammal which has the testes in its body cavity. And that's the elephant. An elephant doesn't have the testes hanging outside his body cavity. It is inside the coelom. And what happens? It is insulated by layers of fat. It's a covering. Okay. Whereas all the rest terrestrial mammals all have the testes outside the body cavity in the scrotal sac controlled by the datos muscle which regulates it. So in case of a flight or flight reaction, the muscles contract and the testes are pulled towards the body for protection. Or in case of severe cold, they are again regressed back. Now, unfortunately, in the females, nothing to bother because their ovaries are already in the sea. Now, these are the defects. Normal shaped, and these are all abnormal shaped uterus. The most important and the nasty one is the septate. So what we have done is, scopically, this septate is cut off. And the cavity area is broadened. Here, bicornuate with single entry, bicornuate with actual double entry. Now, many a times during embryo transfer, when you are having such type of uterus, it's very difficult. What we call it as didelphus, which will be highly proliferating so as to accommodate the embryo transfer or so as to substantiate the implantation. So these are all the anatomical defects also, what we call it as Mullerian duct defects. Then another challenge, endometriosis. Painful disorder. The tissue which lines the internal part somehow starts developing outside of the uterine cavity. Sometimes it covers up the entire mass, even the ovaries. So getting pregnancy, well, it is possible, but it's a little difficult. 
it increases the risk it increases pregnancy complications so what we call it is high risk pregnancy and the most notorious one the pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome these are the reasons simple poly means more cystic means they are not functional follicles they become a cyst they don't rupture and the secretions inside condense and form a nasty white look dark chocolate looking fluid what we call it as a chocolate cyst so these are the symptoms and these are the treatments and this is how your diagrammatic representation your ovary two massive ovarian cyst just like over here this is a tube and look at the condition of the ovary massive follicle just not ready to rupture on the ultrasonography when we see them you see all the development is a lovely necklace pattern but don't be under the impression that any lady or a girl with high obesity is subjected to this there can be even lean pcos or very thin pcos so please investigation is not ideally depending upon the weight or the bmi certain symptoms when they are shown obviously a test of pcos has to be done because it is the most prevalent cause of female infertility and 80% of it is devoted to the lifestyle because once the pcos goes out of control it needs a greater hormonal interplay to bring it down treatment well scopy laparoscopy or diagnostic laparoscopy here it is what drill a hole medical get carbon dioxide inflate the abdomen a trocar with a lamp a camera sees whether the organs are perfect there are no other problems outgrowths correct so it is just as a glance i want to glance into the coelom what the things are or hysteroscopy it is done to see the internals of the uterine environment lining of the uterus endometriosis whether the os is proper whether there is asherman syndrome etc 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 so diagnostic hysteroscopy is used to look inside the uterine cavity and in laparoscopy outside view is taken of how the ovaries look like how the tubes look like etc etc so your basic steps basically select a patient you stimulate you retrieve the oocytes at the same time retrieve the sperm process the sperm get it ready either do an ivf insemination or you do an x injection you culture the gametes subsequently grow them whether till till day 3 or till day 5 transfer them if there are extra cryo preserve them and do a very healthy post luteal support so now we exactly go on to the three steps of art assisted reproductive technique can i take any questions midway or you want me to take the questions at the last banker hello yes sir so we will take the uh, questions once the entire like the entire part of the okay discussion. fine fine no i just thought that maybe in sub suppose if it is quite a lengthy thing then the other there should not be evaporation from the mind okay anyway so what does your art technique do we have to recover the gametes we have to see that they survive well and we have to see that they remain viable because it is the fusion of a and b the egg and the sperm to form c there's the zygote forms d two cell e four cell eight cell morula compaction blastula so it's a five and a half day sequential thing and our gamete should remain viable viable means progressively functional now how is this attained this is attained by providing them all the conditions which are quite similar from vivo to vitro and this is where 
the importance of your lab comes in. The importance of your gadgetry comes in. The importance of your handling epigenetic agents comes in. The protocols, the SOPs. Now, first thing, a lady is stimulated. Why is she stimulated? Because if she is not stimulated, she will be keeping on producing the same type of eggs which she otherwise would have produced. So initially, what was it? The simple procedure like intrauterine insemination. Now, prior to this, what was done? A lady's peak period was found out with the LH surge, and she was instructed to have time relation. So this was called as timed intercourse. Years ago, slowly, there was a drug called clomiphen citrate, which was given to the ladies to enhance ovulation and to improve the quality of the oocyte. So it was CC cycle plus time relation. Then what happened was, they said, okay, no, we will handle the gametes, the male gametes outside, prime them, what we call it as a sperm wash, transfer them into the uterus, what we call it as intrauterine insemination, and so see as it goes on, as the steps kept on increasing, the success rates kept on. Now here is HMG means exogenous hormones, human menstrual gonadotropin. Then there are purified gonadotropins. Okay. And this is exactly what is happening during your stimulation. The pituitary supply is cut off. The patients are kept on OC pills. Once she bleeds, the endometrium is shed. And now the ovary is hanging loose mass of cells. Now we are exogenously harvesting FSH. So we start priming the ovary. So initially when the stimulation starts, there is a recruitment of follicles. Just like we are selecting a cricket team out of 100 probables. And from that, further given a lot of practice and coaching, the few good ones are selected. Now here starts the FSH window. Now here the importance of FSH is very high. Then the lead follicles, they take up the shape of what we call it as the dominant follicles. Now this is how the process goes on. So once on sonography, they attain a certain size in folliculometry, what do they do? They see the dimension, the size of the follicle. So once the folliculometry size comes to 1.8 or 1.9 in a cohort, Injection of HCG is given. Now, why is HCG given? Because LH is not uh, secreted by the pituitary. So, to mimic the LH surge, we are giving the injection of HCG. And then the rupture takes place. Now, this exactly in a diagrammatic form I have shown you. Ultrasound is done. Original picture. Few enteral follicles. Okay. FHS has started being given. Again, a sonography is done at this time. So this is mimicking. Otherwise, the pituitary would have secreted FSH and LH. And here we are given our injections exogenously. Well, follicles are good. So over here, the puncture is done or the pickup is done. Then your culture takes place over here. You do your embryo transfer, and after that, you do a pregnancy test. So this is a schematic diagram as to how your ovulation induction takes place or stimulation takes place. Now, how are they monitored? They are monitored by ultrasonography machines. Now, radio imaging has gone sky high. It's fantastic. There are different types of probes available. Abdominal probe, vaginal probe. Now, what is the principle? The USG machine transmits high frequency at great megahertz sound pulses. They go into the body, bang against an organ, and are reflected back. So when they are reflected back, a typical shape is taken, like this is for the follicles, a triangular pattern is for the liver, mean shape pattern is for the kidneys, a long shape is taken for the spleen 
two small blobs atop the kidney are the adrenals. Correct? A pancake like shape is of the prostate. So, this is exactly how ultrasonography helps you. Depending upon ultrasonography, we can also find out the presence of a cyst or a polyp because they will be dense thing. The waves will be going and reflecting back as a big black blob. So we can make out, oh, there is a cyst or there is a mass. This is how masses are also detected. But the only two enemies of ultrasonography are gas and bone. Because in a gas, the radio waves will be dispersed. And in a bone, they won't be traveling through. Abdominal probe means you can place it on any part, exogenous of the body, whether it's a hand, it's a stomach, wherever. And vaginal probe is a small slender probe which is passed through the vagina so that the internals can be seen properly. Now, when the follicles are there, what we do is a process of follicle aspiration or ovum pickup. Now, this is a gynac here. She is inserting the needle, the sonography is there, the suction, the media, the aspirate is collected in the tubes. So as each follicle is approached, now this concept I will show you in the walk-in lab on a ovum simulator. As to how the probe enters into each follicle, each follicle is collapsed and OCC is retrieved. So this is the principle. The ovum pickup pump creates a vacuum. This vacuum is in the collection tube, one end of which enters the ovary or the oocyte. And this is the bevel. So the follicle collapses. It is aspirated and collected into the tube. Now, these are all the requirements. And this is your OCCs, oocyte cumulus complex, which are subsequently collected once the pickup is done. Why there is a hot block? Because temperature is of ideal importance. All the cells are very thermolabile. Hypo or hyperthermia can be a disaster. A change of 0.2 degrees or 0.3 degrees also can be detrimental. For the sperm, it will mess up with the motility. In the oocyte, it will mess up a very small inclusion which is known as the spindle apparatus. Spindle apparatus is extremely sensitive to temperature, pH and osmotic conditions. There is no recovery once the temperature control trauma is set in a spindle. So this is how it happens. This is your ovary. Through the vaginal probe, there is a needle. It transfers all the way inside. There is also a live video, but unfortunately, I couldn't show it to the students unless and until your guides or your mentors give me permission. Because for some, it may be a little ghastly to look. Okay. Now, these are all the probes. This is the vaginal probe. So it can enter the vagina and you can see it. This is the abdominal probe. And these are very too sensitive micro probes. Like you have to do a thin sonography of the nasal part or the eye part or internal ear. Okay. This is the principle. Patient is under anesthesia. Needle goes, pierces, collapses, collects. So this is the ideal way how basins are abdominal sonography probe is kept. This is a 4D. 3D means 2D means what? X axis and Y axis. 3D means X, Y and Z. So as you see, you see a child completely being seen. And in 4D, you could exactly see a child moving and even sucking the thumb. So these are all to detect fetal anomalies. Now, we come to a little part of the sperm assessment. Now, there are, of course, guidelines, WHO guidelines. You see, they have been there since years. All the parameters seem the same, but except normal forms, 50, 30, 14, 4 and 4. So in one of the most normal male, the most fertile male, the actual number of the right, good, ideal, functional sperm are just 4%. So this is where the sperm comes into play. Less count oligozoospermia, obviously the percentage of the normal sperm will dip down. And in severe oligospermia or severe oligoesthenoteratozoospermia, 
they will be hardly there to be found. So these are all the guidelines available. They are available on net. You can download them. Now this is a system, basically. As I said, in a male lubrication, excitation phase. Now this is soft muscular tissue is the penis where it gets regurgitated with blood pooling. It's the excitation phase, so we get it as an erectile syndrome. Erection. When the spongy cavernosan tissue gets engorged with blood, this is a reflection of the stimuli, your sight, your tactile, the sensuous phase, the orgasmic phase which we come into. We have got one phase lacking, that's the olfactory. In animals, the olfactory phase is fantastically high. Okay? So, once that comes into play, bulbourethral secrete. The contractions start. Much of the blood flow is targeted towards our genitals. Our mindset is completely out. We go into a state of, I could say, sensuous pleasure. Now, this is where all the muscles surrounding the epididymis, the cords, they start contracting. And what do they do? When they contract, they ease out or squeeze out the sperm all the way from here, through this, through this, through this, and out comes an ejaculate. Okay. So the accessories are epididymis, prostate, seminal vesicles. So what is necessary? The smooth functioning, the smooth pathway, and the smooth secretion. Oops, what did I do? Sorry. Now, when we collect, semen is a plethora of flora and fauna. It contains all these things. Now, for a proper andrologist or a semenologist, he has to judge the quantity. If it's a very less quantity, it is acidic. Of course, secretion of only bulbourethral glands. Prostate, acidic. Seminal vesicle is alkaline because it's the maximum secretion. 80% to 85% of the seminal content is bulbo is a seminal vesicle secretion. 10% is prostatic and the rest is the epididymal and the testicular secretion. So volume, pH, and the nature. Very important parameters because in the event of the gentleman going to an andrologist, these values are of prime importance. Now, three another problems which can arise. Prostatitis, seminal vesiculitis, and hemosperma. Now, many a times, I think even ladies and gents both have experienced the sensation of the burning, or I could say irritation, or the nasty prickly feeling in the penile area or the vaginal area. Now, in a male, if it happens, it could be due to two reasons. It could be due to lower UTI infection or it can be due to prostatitis. We feel like we want to go to the, we want to void or we want to urinate quite frequently. But whenever we go there, we just pass a few ml of the urine and we always come back unsatisfied. There is a burning sensation in the lower pelvic area. Well. It may be due to infection. So what to do? Simple for me, it's easy. A routine urine examination and a routine semen examination. If the pus cells are there in the semen, it's prostatitis. If pus cells are abounding in the urine, it's a UTI. Second case, sometimes gentlemen come in with large collection volumes, 7 ml, 8 ml, turgid yellowish in appearance. The sperm are there, but the motility is severely compromised. Now, prostate and seminal vesicles are secretory glands. They give out a lot of secretions. So if their gland is affected, the secretion will be enhanced. Just like when we lacrimate, when something goes into our eye, what do we do? We lacrimate. It washes off the secretions or the infected part or the particulate matter which enters. As a result, the volume becomes large. Means he has to be treated. Last, hemospermia. The blood in the sperm or the semen. So whenever your semen is of this pinkish color, be sure there is RBCs. 
It could be due to prostatic carcinoma. It could be due to bladder carcinoma, or it could be due to severe infection of the prostate, or sometimes very abusive masturbation. So when you collect the semen, it's difficult. You know why difficult? It's not like blood that you push in a hypodermic and you pull out what is there. The patient has to be first counseled properly. Otherwise, extra, the gentleman could have ejaculated like this. But unfortunately, on the day of the procedure, when he is told, he will have an apprehension. And this is what we term as negatives, the turnoffs. If there is no proper collection room, what do you feel? I'm sorry to say, majority of the labs which have visited the collection rooms are just pathetic toilets. Plus, then abstinence period, a three day prior abstinence, no sex, no masturbation, so that the sperm reservoir builds in the body. Method, masturbation is ideal, or sometimes they try coitus interruptus. But in coitus interruptus, it is very difficult to withdraw at the time of initial ejection because the first quarter of the semen contains more than 40% of the most motile sperm fraction. The container. Today, we have got plastic disposables. For years, it was glass. And glass is the best way because glass least reactive with any biological fluid. You must have seen maybe, uh, maybe 10, 15 years back, we used to get everything glass, glass hypodermics, glass saline bottles, glass petri plates, because glass is a super cool liquid. But the problem with glass was you couldn't throw it away. We have to autoclave them, we have to sterilize them, we have to dry them out, and there's a cumbersome effect. So nowadays we are using plastics, but plastics should be good, good quality, because all plastic material lab that are made from polystyrene, it's a polymer. And it should be having zero reprotoxicity, means the amount of the plastic which leaches out into the fluid or the sample should be literally of a nonsensical value, minimal value, so as to cause trauma to the gametes. And last but not the least, added assistance. Some gentlemen, unfortunately, have got issues in collection. So they are provided the help of a vibrator or an ejaculator. Now, this is what your spot examination will tell you in a semen. Volume, important. Nature, if it is viscous. Now, in a lady, when the mucus during a fertile period is pulled, or what we can say the orgasmic period, that's a test with the gynex do. During the progestogenized phase, the mucus secretion is so much that the mucus comes along like a thread. It is under the spin market, the way in which it is pulled down. It is the most receptile or the fertile mucus. Sometimes you get sticky mucus when there is infection or you are ovulated in a few days later on. So they are hostile. They won't allow the entry of the sperm. But in case of semen, it's ulta. The longer the thread you draw while sporing in, the bad is the quality. So it is viscosity. Viscosity means accessory gland infection, especially the prostate. And depending upon the volume, you get the pH the color, motility, and the cellular inclusions. So these are the terminologies. Fine. Now this is a little dangerous thing, aspermia, or what we term as an ejaculation. Now an ejaculation means no semen, as I told you. And azoospermia means no sperm in the semen. Now there is an interesting phase or occurrence which we term as an ejaculation or aspermia, but five to 10% of mm -hmm. the males show problem in masturbation. Some can ejaculate during masturbation, some can't ejaculate during intercourse. Some can ejaculate during intercourse, some can't collect it during masturbation. So these are the lots of problems arising. So what they need to be done is, they need to be counseled. They can be given certain gadgets by which they can try. And all those initial inhibition, because we have seen that sometimes the parents, when the children are young, they just prevent them from doing something, saying, oh, it's nasty, it will affect your health, it is not good, it is a taboo. 
So these are permanently imprinted into the minds. So we have got to counsel them and remove the apprehensions. Plus, there are performance anxieties, there are turn-offs, high expectation, or there is sometimes genetical or a real physiological problem. So you have to consult a urologist. Now, this is a very nice gadget, a vibrator. Some people who have got erectile issues, they can just have a part erection or the sperm phallus doesn't come to the rigidity as far as erection is concerned. So this gentleman is counseled properly. He is told to fantasize about sex. And when he has a part erection, the lower part of the penile area, which is richly innervated, the phallus, it is placed on this pad and the vibrator machine is switched on. It creates an orgasmic effect and immediately he will come into an ejaculate. This is basically a simple body massager which we get in the markets. But he should be taught, he should be shown. I sanike jis din ko procedure hat me de chalo collect karo no. He'll get more perturbed about it. So please make him. It's a very simple. And believe me, if he uses once and he collects the semen, this anxiety is completely opened up. He is cool because he is producing semen which he never did before. So whenever there is a procedure like an IUI or anything, he can deliver the sample on demand. Now, another one is electro ejaculation. It's a little difficult because in cases of gentlemen who have had severe paralysis, face down, no function, okay, they can never have an erection. So this is a machine. This is a probe, what is called as a rectal probe. The patient is in anesthesia under left lateral position. The probe is inserted through the rectal area and it goes a little inside where it meets the seminal vesicle and the prostate. And then slowly the current is switched on from 5 to 50 volts so that increases the vibration. Again, it makes the orgasmic effect and the ejaculate is collected. This cannot be repeated off and on because it has to be done once in two months or three months. Whatever is collected is cryofrozen and the same sperm can be utilized for the procedures. These are the organic problems. Urinary tract fibrosis, prostatic fossa fibrosis, lumbar sympathectomy means innervation of the nerves, autonomic neuropathy. So an andrologist, a surgery and a counseling is essential. Then this is retrograde. Normally, when we ejaculate, the sperm are expelled out, that is anti-grade. And what happens in a retrograde? The sperm, when they come out, instead of going out from the penile area, they get regurgitated back into the bladder because the valve or the sphincter over here is malfunctioning, just like our epiglottis. When we breathe in, the esophagus is shut, trachea is open. When we eat food, trachea is closed, esophagus is open. By chance, if that valve mix functions, a piece of food enters into our trachea, we get a sense of choking. So what happens is now, we are faced with an arduous task of retrieving the sperm from the urine because the gentleman will feel he has ejaculated, but nothing comes in the container. Tell him to wait. These are the reasons why there can be retrograde. Diabetes is also one of the reasons. High BP. And this is how we retrieve the sperm from the urine. We have to nullify the acidic shock of the urine. Collect the urine post masturbation. Check the pellet. Mix it with the sperm media and try to calculate the sperm. Unfortunately, IVF couldn't be done, only XC could be done. Now, cryptozoospermia, hidden sperm, less count. Every semen sample is not going to reflect the number of sperm. So, what we do is 
the centrifuge the semen sample, check the pellet and hunt for the hidden sperm. That is why they are known as cryptozoospermy. So do not ever write in a report that gentleman is azoospermic. No, because one semen sample is not essential to brand a gentleman. At least three semen samples taken with 15 days break and the three days prior to each collection is ideal. It depends upon the mood of the patient. The collection depends upon the psychosomatic stress of the gentleman, the tension, the stress, the apprehensions. Now, all the parameters of the sperm can also be done using a simple gadget, what a single, I'm sorry, it's costly, not simple. So it is CASA, Computer Assisted Semen Analysis. It's a fantastic machine, but still, I trust the precision of the human eye more than it. This CASA is of valuable help in the morphology and the vitality. Because there, when we stain the sperm and see it, the actual infringence principle helps us to detect the good quality sperm. And for the sperm to be utilized, we are using our routine media. Now, what is the important characteristic of the media? A media is the one in which the cells survive. And whenever a human cell survives, there are three areas, intracellular, extracellular, and the membrane. So the osmotic pressure, intra and the extracellular should be the same. If it is more, it is causing osmotic stress. The pH should be perfect. Okay. Now what we are doing in case of sperm, we are washing the sperm, so we are capacitating the sperm. Capacitation means ideally priming the sperm. Now, how are the sperm capacitated in a normal intercourse? In a normal intercourse, when the sperm are deposited, it is met by mucus. The mucus encompasses the sperm completely. And via the mucus, it travels all the way up. So the better the quality of the mucus, the faster the sperm will travel, the propulsion speed. Because something like 10 centimeters, the sperm have to travel all the way to the tubes. And the cervical mucus is the nature's best filter. So out of 10 sperm which are deposited here, max 4 to 5 sperm are able to reach the tubes. The rest of the immature ones, the morphologically abnormal ones are all filtered in the sperm, all filtered by the mucus and they are expelled outside. Now here, what we are doing is we are washing the sperm manually means we are doing the process which the mucus otherwise was doing. So we are eliminating the sperm, plasma. So we wash the sample once, discard the seminal plasma, wash the pellet second time, discard the supernatant, layer it, and we take the aspirate. So this is known as a normal swap method. Idea is eliminate the seminal plasma, Eliminate the obnoxious contents like premature cell, pus cell, cast, epithelial cells, phagocytotic cells, etc., etc., and harvest the best quality of the sperm on the top. Then, second method is density gradient. It is used in case of samples which are a little poor or suboptimal. It consists of the two filters, gradients, and the sperm is kept on top, centrifuged. The best quality of the sperm have a good density or a specific gravity, so they settle at the bottom and they are harvested from there. So, based on this recruitment of the egg and the sperm, we have divided our process into three parts. Intrauterine insemination, wherein only sperm are handled. The oocytes are taken care of inside the body. IVF, we put the sperm or we inseminate the sperm, let the sperm and the egg select themselves. Or intracytoplasmic, well, when we are very short of sperm, we select the ones which we have it and we mechanically inject them into the oocyte. Now, this was IUI. I think we had done this. Now, this is the procedure. The sperm capacitated into the syringe is slowly transferred all the way through a cannula into the uterine cavity. Very gently, gently and slowly. So the harvested sperm of a good nature, good morphometry, will slowly be deposited here. They will find their way slowly into the tubes over here, see, and slowly they will come in. Now, this is exactly what it is. Okay. 
So when we go in for an IVF procedure, what we are doing? We are first investigating. We are doing an ultrasound. We are doing the ovarian stimulation. Then we are doing the pickup. Then either we are doing fertilization or ICSI. Then we are doing the embryo transfer. We are doing the culture also subsequently, luteal support and a follow-up. So these steps, the only difference here is in an IVF, we artificially inseminate, whereas in ICSI, we artificially just inject. Here we are given a choice, the sperm and the eggs. You are ideal, you meet and you procreate. Whereas in ICSI, unfortunately, we don't have a chance. Whatever sperm we get, whatever egg we get, we have to do the injection. So the chance of genetic anomalies in IVF are a little less, and I would say least. Whereas in this case, well, it may tower. This is a diagrammatic presentation. You harvest the eggs, you get the sperm, you culture them, you see the embryo development, and ultimately you transfer it. Whereas in case of ICSI, you catch a sperm, you transfer it into the egg, you have to manipulate the egg, you have to prime the egg, you have to prime the sperm. Comparison, IVF versus ICSI. Well, you want to set a lab. All the conditions from vivo to vitro have to be meticulous. So these are all the necessary equipments or the necessities which you need as far as a lab is set up. So based on this, the subsequent post lens session in which we are going to see the videos will be all targeted into this because it is not that any room is available I can make it or convert it into a laboratory. There are lots of conditions to be taken care of. Air quality, air conditioning, HVAC system, that's heating, ventilation, air conditioning, the light effect, the uninterrupted power supply, the continuous sun wave inverters, then your cryo facilities, your microscopes, your pickup room, the recovery room. So these are all channelized into different sections. Now, this is the very important equipment, what we call it as a micro manipulator, in which you are manipulating each gamete in a very microscopical manner. You are holding the egg and you are injecting the sperm from one. So this is the holding part and this is the injecting part. So this is whole equipment is called as a micro manipulator. You will be seeing the complete procedure in the video session. This is automated. It's like that your video game playing. And this is manual. You have to literally manipulate it by hand up, down in the X, Y, Z motions. And these are all your peripheral stuff. Well, your ovum pickup pump, your incubator, which is the heart, which should be taken exhaustively in the video session your disposables, your online filters between the incubator and the cylinder, your plasticware, your CODA filters, which filter the air existing inside the laboratory. Then these are your cryo cans, the Nivars flux, depending upon the capacity. This is the stereo zoom microscope. This is a bench incubator, and this is the box incubator. Now, why we are doing all this? How are we knowing that we are going on the right way? We have to follow an embryological time scale. Let's suppose we take an egg and a sperm and we inject it. We are going to see its progression. It will progress, no doubts about it. They are tough structures. But you have to see, or we have to regulate the progress in such a way that they should show us a certain developmental pattern at a certain time. So post-injection or insemination, after 18 to 20 hours, I should see the zygote. The first sign of life, a zygote is an unclewed embryo. Then as time progresses, we see a two cell embryo, four cell. So they should be adhering to this time scale. If there are age piche, if there is a lag phase, if there is a slow phase, if there is a hyper phase, all are there. Now what we can do is unfortunately, we can only restrict them to limited sighting. So for that, there are advanced gadgets available, what we call it as time-lapse systems. They continuously photograph the process continuously from day zero to day five. And a complete recording is made. So you just click a button or press a toggle switch. You get the whole image tuck, 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 in the shot. But it's costly. 
something to the tune ranging from 70 lakhs to 1 crore of an equipment. And it is not in everybody's capacity, especially individual doctors to invest into such a big machine. But the trauma is eliminated. The stress when we take out the plate and we observe the stages is eliminated. But most important, the cost factor. Now, this is exactly what we are mimicking the development. This is your tubes. This is the ovary, the egg ruptures. Here, what is it? Leftover will be the egg is ruptured, corpus luteum, fertilizers, ideal area for fertilization. So the medium is IVF media, which we develop in our lab. Progresses. Now look here. Oxygen content low, glucose content low, cleavage, pyruvate lactate low, glucose low, progresses further, complete reversal, pyruvate lactate low, glucose is high, oxygen concentration high, oxygen concentration low. That's why they say open tube should be functional tube. Now what I meant by functional is the tube has to confirm all the functions. It is a lovely amalgamated version of all secretions churning in together. And there is a cilia network which will keep on pushing this conceptus all the way out. Once it pops out, it's a compacted morula. It will feed on the uterine secretion, what we call it as a uterine milk. Depending upon the development of the endometrium, it will oppose, adhere, attach, implant, post rupture. And we are what? We are hemochorial placenta. We bleed because there is development of the three types of villi, primary, secondary, and tertiary. So when this embryo implants, the development of the villi takes place. Then the area gets differentiated, cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast. Then this area, after 14 days of invasion by the embryo or the blastocyst, secretes its own hormone, which is human chorionic gonadotropin HCG. And it's one subunit is a beta subunit, which is easily detected in the blood. So if beta HCG blood may have this period where you are pregnant. And pregnancy is a nasty thing. We get it when we don't want it. We don't get it when we want it. So this is a parameter by which we can even catch it by you are pregnant. The embryo has implanted inside. Now what happens? Now there is a synchronization between the endometrium and the ovary. The HCG level gives a signal to the ovary, ke, please, corpus luteum, you wait. Don't form corpus albicans. I want the secretion of progesterone from your side to nurse me. Okay. So it secretes HCG. Use a signal, extra progesterone, supports the endometrium. And one more thing, the high level of progesterone itself will send the signal to the pituitary. I don't want more follicles, please. She is pregnant. She cannot get a period now. So the very high circulating level of progesterone will prevent the pituitary from secreting FSH. At the same time, another hormone gets stimulated luteinizing hormone, luteotrophic, milk production. So the memory glands start developing. Anticipating the fetus would come after eight months, so I would definitely give it milk. Lactating mothers. So lactating mothers have high level of prolactin, and this high level of prolactin is a natural contraception. It will prevent the more FSH development, so no follicles. So if the weaning is there. The child is weaned after three, four, six months. Automatically, the prolactin level falls, FSH shoots up, and the lady gets a period. So this is a wonderful manifestation of all hormonal interplay which takes place. So that's what they say, that Indian mothers, they lactate the children for a very long time, so that's a natural contraception. Now, when you prepare your dishes, some prepare in droplets, some layer with oil, some prepare in open culture. So this is all the techniques and the precision and the skill and the dexterity of an embryologist, all working under aseptic conditions, for which 
gadgets are needed. Laminar air flows, HEPA filters, inflow pressures, positive pressure modules, etc., etc. So, what does your media do? Suboptimal media will result in this. Media prevents the oxidative stress by reducing, and these are the content or the contents of your media. This is the sequential pattern. When you flush your follicles, you are using hippie space media, which has to be only incubated. Advanced media are to be equilibrated. Now, this is a very long, exhausting thing, which I will be telling you in the video sessions. Equilibration means chemically priming the media. Incubation means just 37 degrees. Whenever there is isolated gamete, only a sperm or the OCC incubate. Culture media incorporating proteins, amino acids, essential amino acids, carbohydrates, bring it to a condition, follow the Henderson Hasselbeck's equation and culture. So, this is the sequence of the media usage. And these secretions are all taken from the secretory capacity of the uterine tube, selective area wise. We did this again, sorry. Yeah. Now, last but not the least transfer the conceptus or the VVIP back to where it goes or where it belongs. So the procedure is called embryo transfer. It's a unison or a play between a gynecologist and an embryologist. Embryologist will give the ideal conceptus. The gynecologist will load it, uh, inseminate it or insert it. At the same time, the gynec has to see that the endometrium is well primed, secretive, secretions, thickness, 9 to 10 millimeter is the blood flow. Now, for this, the lady is taken in a lithotomy position. Cusco speculum is inserted in the cervix. It is spread open and through such type of catheters, what we call it as embryo transfer catheters. These catheters are very thin, soft ones, the tips. They are loaded and they are transferred all the way inside your uterine cavity along with the conceptus. I don't know whether you can see it or not. Can you see the catheter tip going in? So this is exactly where they are inseminated in the central part. So it has to come till here. Now this process is very sensitive. This process is responsible for majority of the IVF failures because how we negotiate See, this is how the catheter is negotiated into the endometrium. The conceptus is released. This is the tip of the catheter, echo tip, because it is done under ultrasonography. So you can check catheter It should not be very much touching the fundus, otherwise, there will be uterine contractions. They can go into the tubes. This is how the speculum is kept. This is how the slowly the passage goes in. So please, prior to an every embryo transfer, a mock embryo transfer is done because it helps us know what it is. Now see, under sonography, this is a straightened uterus. Here there is a utero cervical angulation. Here there is a severe angulation because why? There is a bladder on the top. If the bladder is overfull, it will compress. If the bladder is totally empty, the angulation will be very drastic. So negotiation is going to be a problem. Now look, the ET catheter is given, the cervix has passed. This is the tip of the catheter. With the push, the conceptus is released. So this is an air bubble which causes an interface along with the radio waves. So you can see a blot or what we call it as embryo flash. And this is where subsequently your embryo is going to nestle. Now, what is to be taken care of? Cervical health. Cervix should be healthy, no disease. No secretions, polyps or other inclusions have to be eliminated, adhesions have to be eliminated. If there is a long cervical canal, we should record it. Os, pinpoint os. Sometimes os is very tiny. It's very difficult to spot. Misplace os, sometimes it's on one side. Asherman syndrome, connections all inside. Very sensitive cervix, you touch it and it starts bleeding. End root obstructions. Angulations, improper bladder filling. Now, see here, this is the bladder. If it is overfull, it will compress completely. If it is partly full, 
this pathway will be straightened up a little bit so the ease in negotiating the catheter will be there now age and aneuploidy of course you always say by elderly yoga abhi to bachche mein problem aayega definitely aata hai now look at this chromosome abnormalities increase implantations decrease aneuploidy risk increases with the increasing maternal age miscarriages increase with the increasing maternal age so maternal age is very important right from that time the quality of the oocyte is concerned till the peripheral effects in the embryo in the implantation potential etc etc now last but not the least what do we do hcg lady has missed the period 14 days she is having some slight symptoms so sonography so in a sonography intrauterine pregnancy is a presence of a gestation sac yolk sac embryo and a cardiac activity which starts bubbling so fourth week or fifth week the cardiac activity pulsatility starts okay you are pregnant you are carrying a viable fetus in your uterus bingo congratulations your blood levels initially the hcg level shoots up shoots up shoots up and then slowly it starts dipping down so these hcg levels either by a urine test or a blood test but then there could be nasty pregnancies a blighted ovum can also show you initial beta hcg rise chemical pregnancy molar pregnancy or a biochemical pregnancy this can all fool us well uterine support a body can't tolerate or body can't produce enough progesterone so as to maintain the uterine environment healthy because the placental cake which is formed will take approximately 2 and a half to 3 months so till that time exogenous progesterone injections or a support has to be there so many a times after the fetus is born the doctor presses the uterine part and the after birth comes out or what we call it as a placental cake comes out so all this maintenance is thanks to the exogenous progesterone there are injectable progesterones which were very ghastly because they used to form a depo effect very painful nowadays there are pessaries or insertion pessaries in the cervical area quite close to the os in somewhere in this area because they were in elastic capsules so the liberation of micro quantity of a drug was targeting the endometrium very well so otherwise in a normal condition your this is cavity is thinned out otherwise in a proliferated endometrium it just expands out the area because remember a full term baby nearly 75% of the lower pelvic area is occupied by the developing fetus so post fourth month or fifth month when the fetus develops and it pushes the diaphragm and all the organs a little up the mother will witness some problems a sudden palpitation a sudden rapid beats exhaustion a hemoglobins will go down so this is nothing else but a very well developing fetus pushing itself up and trying to occupy space now this will be a little more chronic in case of twins you got my point because the occupancy the liquor volume will be definitely higher yeah so post iui or embryo transfer beta hcg levels are appreciated repeat they will shoot up your post uterine support continues fetal activity ongoing pregnancy and a live take home baby now a little bit a few slides on the ideal lab environment now why do we need a good environment because we need all these conditions and what do we expect good results ideal embryos so you can even get a pregnancy with a single embryo transfer we can preserve the extra embryos and we can meet patient's expectations so how to do qa qc success of contamination control doesn't come from the absence of contaminants but the capability to because no lab will be completely devoid of any contamination believe me there can be small micro contaminations arousing anywhere because what we have to do is we have to standardize our procedures we have to synchronize our work pattern we have to form charts we have to form standard operating procedures so we have to stick to quality control quality assurance and standard laboratory practice so we have to control the culture conditions 
take care of the epigenetic agents and take a peripheral or a collateral care, which is done by our total quality management systems. So these are certain guidelines, EUTDC, CAP USA, HIFA, and ICMR. A general idea about classification of contaminants, physical, chemical, biological, and energy. Okay. Brief points. Items not allowed in the clean room. Human hand and saliva, how much bacteria they can contaminate. Or skin shed particles, when we move, when we talk, when we walk. Oral flora and fauna, this must be the, in the headlines since last two years. Salivary droplets, importance of a face mask. And foreign embryologists, please marry your machines. Proficiency can't be attained within a day. Go through the manuals, digest them. Don't try stunts on fresh machines because the smallest part of a good micro manipulator is something not less than 25,000 rupees. Exhibit great care and caution. Remember, a poor workman will always blame his tools and everything looks easy as long as the others do it. Now, this is a very nice picture. A lady went through an IVF cycle. She preserved all her syringes and vials which she had taken for treatment. And when the baby was born, this is how she had decorated it. Well, very important slide. And of course, thanks to my training center where we have Tashwood undergone, or rather still undergoing vigorous training for candidates. We enroll gynecologists who want to set the labs. Once you have set the labs, they want to improvise it. We entertain young budding students. And now with the condition of ICMR, that if you want to enter embryology, you have to do an embryology degree course for two years. That's very important. That's very good also. Plus, you should have in a short term based knowledge. So this is where small institutions like ours come into play, where we totally train for andrology only, whether it's for cryopreservation, advanced 6C, lab QA, QC. So these all details are available. You are most welcome to enter call me or email me. And this is my actual company where I'm a uh, what I can say, so faculty or a consultant, because we are deeply into IVF. Take lab 20 projects, equipments, training support, media consumables, and new inventions. Fine. So thank you. Thank you very much for the patient here. Thank you so much, sir. That was genuinely very insightful and just gave us a lot of idea of what exactly IVF is and how exactly uh, do we go about it and what actually like the practical aspects and how does it actually work. So that was pretty helpful. <clears throat> so we do have some questions in from yeah, the- Yeah, but before I enter the question, yeah. now this was just the tip of an iceberg because each topic can go on for, an, for hours together because there is separate andrology, separate oocyte, separate cryobiology, separate machinery, QA, QC, lab structure, and of course, nowadays, a lot of paperwork. Because today, the situation is such, and the permissions you have to take from the PCP entity, from the genetic department, from blah, 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 and space availability. Because in a city like Mumbai, you have to fight for a square inch of place. Whereas you go out of Mumbai, you have got places like a football field. So when we take a lecture on QAQC, you won't believe in a foreign country where they set up a lab, they set up always on the outskirts of a city with a permission that for next 10 years, no other construction will come around that building within a 1.5 kilometer radius. So this must, they are sure of it. Earthquake proof building, fire retardant materials. They plan their windows in such a way that they don't face the oncoming air currents. You know, these are all intricacies, but unfortunately, well, it all, there are two things in IVF. It is willpower and willpower. You have it, you spend it, like in any other aspect of uh, technology. And technology is also sky high. Never think that a new technology comes always works to your best. Technology is what that it comes, you say, oh my God, fantastic. I wonder how I lived without it. After some time, what you'll say, oh, it's shit. Yeah, I wouldn't even give it to my dog. And after some time you say, chalta hai, kisi mein chalta hai, kisi mein chalta hai. You know, we also take a very slow one. We, we, we walk the fence. But the difficult part is 
why is IVF very challenging compared to other surgeries and all? Because in other surgeries, the patient walks into the hospital, gets himself rectified, goes back happily, it is done. Whereas in IVF, it is a question mark for the first 15 days till the beta HCG is done. And even then, the success rates are quite low. And success rates can't be measured only in terms of beta HCG. Till the child is born, so in a foreign lab, the success rate is ultimately a take-home baby rate. They don't believe the initial beta HCG level. Of course, the cardiac activity is a proof. At least you are carrying a viable fetus in the uterus. But then what? Then what is the real challenge? To maintain the pregnancy, to create the environment. So it's, it's, it's a long, arduous journey. Fine. Now can I take questions? Yes, sure. Uh, so we have a presentation ready with, with all the questions that are there that have okay. been asked in the YouTube chat and also on the Zoom chat. The first, the first is the age, especially if she's a lady. Okay, because even a male will produce sperm till 65, 70 years, but the quantity on the quality will deteriorate. So the number of attempts to take and to conceive a child will be much more than what he would have taken had he been in 30, 35 years. Now, as far as age is concerned, quality of the eggs, plus peripheral diseases, sickness, diabetes, obesity, thyroid, blood pressure. So this is very important or some hereditary factors. Right. And of course, previous failed cycles, which unfortunately the patients are not ready to tell us. Because if a new lab is there, you know, all the waste of the other lab or the discards of the other lab will come rushing to you. So this makes the challenging more difficult. Consider for patient. Yeah, this is all it. Then the anatomical findings. Scopies. In a gentleman, which name? Semen analysis, sperm survival test, hormone levels, and other problems. Tobacco smoking, very important. Lazy cilia syndrome. Abstain from tobacco. Motility comes back to normalcy. Deprivation of antioxidants. So give him vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin B with complex with zinc. It will pep up the motility and the characteristics of the semen. Fine. Next one. Are there any government schemes that have helped you? No, unfortunately, in ART, even the insurance agents don't give you anything because already we are having a population explosion. So, so ultimately they don't. But of course, there are certain companies which assist financially because the biggest turn off is what? Price. Now, when a couple comes and we talk, okay, sir, kitna hoga? Bolega, lak, dead lak hoga. Par success rate kitna? 30%. Are, to itna deke 30%. You know, because they are not understanding, then we tell them that if you would have not done the procedure, you wouldn't have even stood in the 30%. Now, even in the 30%, some are at this level, some are at this level, some are having a problem. So we have to counsel them. So that's why counseling is very important. And a good counselor is the one who will tell you the pros and cons of everything. And out of 10 people you counsel, three will go away because you have told them the truth. You got my point. And in ART, whenever a patient tells you a yes or a no, don't digest it immediately because across the table, they are in that sort of an enthusiasm. So they will immediately blur out a yes. After going home, they'll call you. Nay, sir, abhi nahi karna hai. Ek do rukte hai. You got my point. Because there are lots of stressy. Uh, an infertile patient is emotionally, financially, and physically traumatized. Now, today, if I say a simple procedure like an IUI, actually, Evidence-based indicator test results are just 5% to 12%. But in some labs where I myself have worked, they are as high as 25%. Why? Because young couples who decide to space the career, they say, no, not this one, not this one. They spend years together, no relations properly. Then suddenly they want to become pregnant overnight. So they rush to a doctor. The doctor tells me, everything is okay with you. Why go through a procedure? No, no, you do it or I'm going to another doctor. And we don't want to miss a patient. So we recruit them for IUI. And the minute we tell them that we are going to treat you, that apprehension is broken. treatment So even the IUI dates will definitely check up. So these are non-indicative cases without having any problem. They are absolutely normal. But it was the psychosomatic stress which was suppressing them. Yeah. Government schemes. This is
habits, lifestyle, obesity, eating, not eating at the right time, not eating the right thing at the right time, plus genetic issues, exercise, accumulation. That's the only basic. Provided it is detected early. So what happens is in young girl childs, whenever there are any problem with the periods, either the, either the girls don't tell the parents or the parents also ignore it. Till it crosses a certain threshold beyond which it's difficult to control. It is a, yeah, it is an agent, uh, causative agent worldwide. PCOS means synonymous. There has been huge pharma research as far as PCOS is concerned. Next. Why is more harmful periods? Both are bad. Both are bad actually. Now, late periods means the onset of periods has started, but more taken into consideration is how frequent are the periods? With how regularity are you getting your periods? That's more important. A very long luteal phase, a short luteal phase. Then in the periods, the flow pattern the heavy the flow, the light the flow, the type of the blood which comes. It is just the spotting or it is just sleep red blood like just on a patient about you always say na, paisa color tha. Light, pale, clots tha ki nahi. So this is subjective. So this was all the cases of what we call it is there can be dysfunctional uterine bleeding, DUV. Because whenever a lady exudes blood more than 90 ml approximately during each cycle, it is considered to be heavy bleeds. Now this, this, so everything is controlled to your oogenesis. It's like you go back, endometrial priming thick me, you are progesterone thick me, progesterone thick me, you get follicle graphene thick me, follicle graphene thick me, you get usai thick me, usai thick me, you get rizzo thick me. It's like, you know, you go up, 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 up. Next. Nobody's asking about the sperm. Sad. Oh, Agaya. What are the medical aids to avoid erectile dysfunction? It depends upon what erectile function is due to. That could be due to a mental stress, a financial stress, a family stress, dismarital effort amongst two partners, some sort of an apprehension, some sort of a guilt conscious, you know, or some business oriented issues. Now, you have seen in many of the big cities and big tech savvy cities where there are lots of IT techs going on, the infertility is huge. Nothing wrong with them. Hormonally, nothing wrong. But this is one of the problems. Because forever being stressed out with something, or there may be a genuine problem, there may be some nerves issue or a nerve damage, etc., etc., or there may be some anatomical issue, but 90% erectile dysfunction is due to stress related things. Smoking, alcoholism, habits. Okay, because remember, our mind is a battle house of thoughts. Every time we think about something, 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 though always we say, hey, I am cool, I don't think about, but every time your brain does recapitulate something or the other. And we tend to remember the nasty things with a much more periodicity rather than the normal things which take place. And once you have this, every time you will have at the back of your mind, the feeling, oh my gosh, even this time it's going to be a failure. You got it. This pre-apprehensions kill us. Is there anything that could make it easy? See, IVF success, well, now IVF success could be on two issues. One is, of course, the patient quality and one is the procedural aspect of a lab. A lab produces embryos, but that doesn't mean that the QAQC is absolutely stuck to the meticulous detail. Because as I told you, in IVF, the only thing we are doing is we are observing the gametes. We are studying the morphology. Maybe the time scale also might be right. But... Small biological changes, biochemical changes, we are totally unaware. So all that glitters is not gold. We have seen embryos which have been literally laid off. Patients, pregnant grade two embryos Because what we are doing is we are grading them at a wrong time. Now an embryo which is about to cleave, it will look very nasty. Then one which has cleaved and settled will look lovely. 
Now, suppose we happen to see the embryo at the time when it is clearing. We would say, oh my gosh, it is fragmented. So we said, yeah, pregnant in yoga. Sure, ultimately, when the beta HCG comes, she is the one who is pregnant. The other ones with which we have uh, betted our last dollar in a pocket, they give up negative results. So lab conditions, quality recruitment, okay, quality gametes, and peripheral QAQC of the lab. So these are all coming. So if there is a QAQC, QAQC topics are more lengthy than the procedure of embryology itself. Is there a oh, fine? Next. How many times? As long as your financial support is there, good. Believe me, believe me, one thing. Now, when you do simple sorts of ART treatment, like an IUI, always IUI is done in a batch of four cycles, back to back every month. Because what happens, cycle one results are here, cycle two results are here, three are here, and four are here. So this is a cumulative success rate. Now, many a times people just do one cycle, they become non-pregnant, or patient ko kata hoga, uske se, to wapis uske paas And then they will come spontaneously conceived on their own after two months. You got my point. So what is to, to be told to them is in the first cycle, we are prepping their ovaries with exogenous hormones so that the subsequent follicle reserve is more healthy. So that's the logic of doing four cycles back to back. You got it. There are results in the first cycle also, no doubts about it. But what is the reason for a cumulative cycle is okay, the first cycle has pepped up the redundant ovaries with exogenous hormones. So the follicles are pepped up. So the lead follicle which comes every cycle is a more healthier version. You got my point. And it is a detailed study that the success of spontaneous consumption four to six months after the patient has completely given up on ART is 40% because the tension is absolutely eliminated in that patient. So stress is the biggest factor. So, well, it depends. Yes, obesity can be linked. Obesity, accumulation of fat, accumulation of fat, a functioning of the Cushing syndrome, adrenals go into play and obesity and reproductives never go hand in hand because of the stress also. Now, whenever a person is obese, there is stress. Now, this is a very nice significance which you have asked me because when we are controlling the gonadotropic releasing factors in the hypothalamus, okay, they are very close to the center which also controls depression in the brain. So, suppose a patient is stressed out he is taking antisomatic drugs, antipsychotic drugs to control his depression. They, they mask the functions of the reproductives. So the reproductive axis gets shattered. As a result, the person loses interest in sex or in case of males, the probability of abnormal sperms coming in are very higher. Or even in female, when there are stress, sometimes the periods are missed. So all these peripherals are there. So yes, obesity causes a lot of tension and stress. To counter the stress, he takes psychotic drugs and they inadvertently affect the cycle. After birth of a child, can women's placenta be preserved? This is a little sci-fi movie type question, but I don't think so. Okay, right now, placenta is preserved. I don't know why you want to preserve the placenta for stem cells or subsequently. Well, the stem cell is a vast topic. It has its own positives and own negatives, own followers and own disbelievers. But till today, actual concrete research is still lacking so as to be able to put into an actual practice for one and all. Next. Unruptured follicle syndrome. And mutinous unruptured. Well, I won't be able to answer it much. It's a proper foray of the gynecologist. But still, unruptured follicle syndrome means, no, it's not unruptured follicle. No, I, these both nearly are the same as such. But there is also another thing called empty follicle syndrome that is very much prevalent. Now, suppose I am getting the aspirate in a flush media. So when I check the aspirate, if the aspirate is absolutely light yellow akin to urine, I could say so, with not even a granulosa cell, which means that 
the hcg has failed okay means there is no priming correct or there is no liberation of even the granulosa cells forget the follicle rupture because hcg primes the oocyte from metaphase 1 to metaphase 2 at the same time it <clears throat> primes the granulosa cells but if you get a follicle aspirate there are granulosa cells there are empty follicles occ is there but there is no oocyte inside that is an empty follicle syndrome so sometimes when the follicles were not ruptured we used to give them a second trigger after another 12 hours to see if she ruptures again but that is see it's i would suggest an embryologist should know something about gynecology and a gynecologist should know something about embryo but they shouldn't be masters of both otherwise jack of all is master of none next certain in the hot water shower yes 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 as i told you testes scrotal sac less temperature outside of the body cavity contact with the body cavity tight towers compaction heat effect sometimes pooling of blood varicocele and temperature related detrimental effects in the acrosome so it is not saying a, so that's for people who wear the absolutely tight subscrotal suspenders for hours together even at night they definitely have such a problem not only that what happens is that the inguinal nerves also they get compacted so it's just like a pooling effect so when they are palpated the testes when palpated should be appearing free and the cord should be felt less like you know like like loose cords not that not that typical thickening now this is all done by the endologist and maybe he will do a vasogram or maybe he will do a sonography and then in sonography he will find just like we do a dvt in the legs the flow pattern of the blood he can detect that that's what i exactly discussed after a few cycles when a couple has totally given up ke bhaiya chhodo abhi let me remain childless i don't mind so the mental block is over and the rate of spontaneous conception 3 to 4 months after the couple having then 4 to 5 cycles is more than 35% okay so apart from this there are few questions that have come up in the zoom chat so i'm going to just ask them to unmute themselves and ask me the question sure 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 um, so we are start yeah carry on we are starting the next session at 2 o'clock huh? yes fine <laughs> yeah uh the people have asked the questions can you all just raise your hands so one by one we can uh, get your questions yes no but i can unmute your questions good afternoon yeah good uh, afternoon so my question was how many embryos are usually transferred during ivr actually speaking now the worldwide scenario is for any embryo but there are lots of things needed for an elite embryo first of all people who do elite embryo trans so they utilize the facilities of those expensive gadgets like time lapse so they can select what is the best embryo still even that gadget cannot make a proper decision it is a probability now when we are not using time lapse we are just visualizing and our human eye cannot justify which is the best one and which is the bad one and plus in the lady now in a foreign country or in european countries or american associations there the concept of treating a lady is fantastically different there they undergo regular health checks right from the time they are 35 so the health of the cervix the general health of the endometrium etc is precise and pristine i would say so so there the concept of single embryo transfer can work plus also the financial aspects in many countries the cycles are paid for they are given promotion for that But in our country, unfortunately, it is not so. And we say, "Okay, chalo, we can freeze them." But remember, freezing and thawing also take its toll on the embryo development or the quality, provided the precision is extra. Anyway, it's like freezing completely into an animation state, minus one ninety seven, waking it up, recovering it, surviving it, making it viable. So there is a little difference. So I would prefer at least two, or two good quality ones, provided the selection is ideal. now suppose from a large cohort of eggs you are getting five grade ones i can say it with surety that all must be grade one but from three oocytes if you are getting two embryos which you say are grade one their implantation potential is still suboptimal so it all depends upon the judgment of the embryologist provided you monitor the day to day progression 
Yeah, next. Yes, so I just have a follow up for that question. Okay. So wouldn't that like if you implant uh, two embryos, wouldn't that increase the chances of having non-identical twins? The chances or the probability of twinning in triplets is very, very less. So before we just jump to a conclusion, twins no. How often you have seen twins? People have transferred four, but not a single pregnancy. Forget the transfer of twin. And in the event of a twin or a triplet, there is a body's phenomena called natural resorption, or what we call it as a vanishing twin. It is very rarely that all the three in a triplets or all two in a twin start. Kabi kabi hota, oh, twins, twins, very happy. Oh my gosh, the cardiac activity of the second one is not good. Oh my gosh, it is shrinking. It is showing IUGR, intrauterine growth. So obviously, body is sensible enough. Or there can be forcible reduction. You know, embryo reduction via the needle. But then it can be traumatic also because it can contaminate the already existing other healthy fetus also. It's like that. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Adela, you can go next. Uh, good afternoon, sir. So my yeah. question is, is uh, automatic micromanipulation preferred over manual one? It depends upon the user. Suppose you are accustomed to one micro manipulator, which you have been using automated since years. Suddenly I place you on other version, you will find it very difficult. So it is very difficult to bring a change in as precision of an equipment like a manipulator. But 99%, I would say 98% of manipulators are those automated, the Nari Shige. You know, then there are even a, uh, what you call electronic, what we append off. You just, you, just, you just place them, press the tick, tick, tick coordinates, automatically the needles will come and set at the right place. But they are really costly, nearly twice the cost as what are the normal manipulators are. Yes, sir. thank you. Kaizen, you can go next. Uh, so my question is, in any way, can autoimmune diseases have effect on one's fertility? Uh, well, it is yes, but unfortunately, I won't be able to answer this because my I have not dug into in this in depth, in which I am not sure I don't answer. Thank you, sir. Petra, you can go next. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. So, so I had a question that uh, sometimes uh, tubectomy needs to be performed in the females who have uh, ectopic pregnancy. So, is it yes. possible for a female yes. to become pregnant using IUT? IUT, can you just expand it? Intrauterine transfer. Intrauterine transfer, but means an embryo transfer. No, I'm, I'm, yes, not get, I'm not getting your answer. I'm not getting your question. Sorry, come again. So, uh, if a uh, female has undergone the tubectomy surgery. Okay, means single, unilateral. Yes. Okay, she, if she has undergone unilateral tubectomy, fine. Then subsequently, her other tube is functional. Okay, but then if her other tube is functional, why should she go in for an ERD? That's the question. You got my point. So, because whenever Rap yes. huh, carry on, unless and so, until both the tubes are affected, or she thinks, or maybe they say, ke, sometimes you know what happens, the bad effects of one tube, it leaches and also compromises the other tube. So to play it safe, if you are going for an ART, then very well, you can go ahead because once the tubectomy is done, the edge of the tube is sealed. Now, sometimes when there is bilateral tubectomy, both the tubes are blocked or both the tubes are cauterized. So ultimately, that's the best case because oogenesis is normal. It is only that the transport system between the ovaries and the uterus was damaged. The pathway was obstructed. You can go ahead with it. Why not? Okay, sir. Thank you. So the last question will be by Hiba. And Hiba, you can go. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, sir, in some ladies, the case happens such that uh, their ovary, uh, the uterus cannot hold the embryo. In such cases, when IVF is performed, what can we do uh, for that, uh, for the uterus to hold? Is it possible yes, yes, in such you cases? Mean, you mean to say the receptive of the uterus is not proper? There are perineal aborters. So they become pregnant and they abort. Now, this has given rise to what we call it as surrogates. You know, so surrogates is what like they are the womb on high. But I think now that is also going to be regulated. I don't know. It is totally banned because, well, it had raised some nasty unethical issues. 
because his surrogacy was going left, right, and center. It was like the victimization of the poor. But let's not enter into the topic. But yes, because now, if initially there was a problem, then there were certain media, like what we call it as uh, embryo transfer assisting media. So what they used to do like this, like the embryo glue, which was marketed by vitrolite. What it used to do? It used to mimic the secretions of the endometrium. So when it was placed inside, if possible, I can give you this video on Sunday. Maybe there are some two, three clippings of that. But you know, the videos is for the foreign videos. Sometimes they don't work well and it causes an embarrassment on the day when we're actually playing it. So the receptivity of the endometrium is not proper. So there are cases where the lady has aborted four to five times, but still they can't afford a surrogate the cost which runs into lakhs. You got my point. So it is there you have to first prime the endometrium. The initially what we used to do, we used to do a simple curettage. Aapko malum aga, curette kara diya. Curettage was what? It was a specular shape like this. It used to enter the uterus and it used to scrape off all the internal lining. Thinking a fresh lining will be tough and it will implant. And it used to work. Don't, uh, it, was a, it was an irony. But today, what happens is, okay, in an overzealous thing, we keep on repeating cycles back to back very fast. We are not giving the old endometrium time to shed off, replenish it. That may be also one of the reasons. But yes, as you said, they are called perineal aborters. It may happen. The best was, of course, till date, surrogacy or maybe improvising the implantation rate by using this extra media like what we call it as uh, embryo glue or UPM, universal transfer media. It is all probability, I tell you frankly. In embryology, there is no guarantee. Okay. Anything else? Yes, so there are two like there are two people that have also come up with questions. So Vinay, you can go next and then I'll take the last one. Yeah, thank you, Anni. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. General question. Uh, do uh, children born via IF can face uh, uh, you know, uh, higher uh, health risks uh, as no, they get no, older? No, no, no. No, I tell you. Now, see, excuse me. What I mean to tell you is, it depends upon. Now, see, when they were saying IUIs, let's take it. It is just inseminating of the pure sperm into the uterus, finds its own way, fertilizes, no interference, right? That's the reason WHO had not considered this as an ART technique because as far as ART is concerned, both the gametes have to be from vivo to vitro. Then it came with IVF. Egg, sperm, put them, select. Ideal egg will select the ideal sperm, otherwise there is no fertilization. So it is unless and until all the characteristics morphologically, genetically, more biologically are met with zygote form. That's why IVF fertilization failure rates are a little higher. Now we nixi, then you have no choice. Jo sperm mile usi ko dalne. So unfortunately, we have to get, capture those sperm and howsoever techniques are available, like MC, intracytoplasmic magnified sperm injection, where a sperm head is magnified to 7,000 times. But you are just seeing the outer changes, you are not seeing the molecular aspect. So this is there, where a chance, a problem can arise. So unfortunately, if the eggs are fertilized with abnormal sperm or with poor oocytes, nature has its own way of preventing them. Either they won't form a zygote. If they form a zygote, they won't form a viable embryo. It will arrest. Even if it doesn't arrest and be transferred, they don't implant. If they implant, the lady has a high chance of abortion. And if ultimately the abortion also doesn't take place and the child is delivered, then there is a child with an abnormality, which we consider one in 10,000, one in 20,000. So nowadays, post 36 years implantation, there are what we call it as fetal markers, triple markers, sonographically, blood wise, they see the fetal length, they see the spina bifida, they see the acrosomal prop, I mean, the uh, mega, mega, uh, mega brain development as a terminology, I forgot. Then there is problem with the ut uh, urinary system. You know, so these are all markers which they do. But the thing is, there can be a minute genetic unisbis occurring, especially in case of ICSI. They do carry a slight risk because remember, we are not sure of the sperm which we are injecting and we are not sure of the egg in which we are injecting. Okay, that's the logic. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. And for the last question, uh, do you have something more to add? Sorry. 
Uh, yeah, so so uh, we know that the ultimate aim of this all procedures is to have children. Uh, but as we see in India, we have so many orphan children. So don't you think that uh, adoption this, is the right way? Uh, yeah. Adoption Rather than ke, adoption, ke liye line kitne badi hai? Malum nahi kya hai? Adoption ke liye tumhara number aa jayega, to bure ho jaoge. Anyway, continue, continue. No Hello? sir, no sir, that's yeah. it. एम्ब्रियो and the patients gets anamda re embryo bana to fir implantation kyun nahi hua agar nahi hua to bolta re ye time to bhagwan ki marzi nahi thi hum dobara karayenge so they repeat the cycle after cycle still they literally wear themselves out thin financially and mentally but you cannot explain endocrinology to each and every of those couples you got my point that's the sad part so if you tell it straight away ke nahi bhaiya ye aap se hoga nahi तो बोले सर सामने वाला तो बोलता है हो जाएगा तुम क्यों नहीं बोलता है तुमको कुछ मालूम नहीं है यू नो देन लाइक सपोज इफ अ पर्सन इज परफेक्टली नॉर्मल हेल्दी मेनी टाइम्स इट हैज एंड वी डोंट गिव देम अ टैबलेट सिंकिंग कि भाई तुम्हें कुछ जरूरत नहीं है डॉक्टर को कुछ आता नहीं है मेरे को दवाई नहीं दिया उसने बट सपोज इफ यू जस्ट लाइट अ सिंपल प्रिस्क्रिप्शन ऑफ बी कॉम्प्लेक्स और सम विटामिन बहुत होशियार है इमीजिएटली मेरे को दवा दे दिया उसने इट इज लाइक वेन यू टेक अ पोअर पर्सन Usually we used to offer services to poor persons. The doctors never used to. But one doctor told me that KRC always charge a minimum of say hundred rupees from that patient because what he feels. I am poor, so pass pay sir, bini liya, I say nikal diya. But if you take money na, usko lagta hai ke nahi. He meant business. You got my point. So nobody would appreciate the free services. They take it in another way. A poor tha, two minutes dekha, pay sir, bini liya, dekh na, mere usko kuch bhi nahi liya. Abhi leta hai, to bhi problem, nahi leta hai, to bhi problem. It's like that. Fine. Next. So, so one of the questions is by Lakshmi Jain. So the question is: So in surrogacy, when someone else's eggs are being implanted, is there a chance for the surrogate body to reject those eggs? Yes, very Since much. Because... Even even in a normal person, when IUI is done or embryo transfer is done, the body's first thing is it will reject any foreign material. Okay. So this is that. It counteracting all this, we have to do an embryo transfer. So this is where the precision lies. Now suppose I put a speculum in the cervix and I open the beak and I stretch. Automatically, physical trauma is there. So physical trauma starts. The muscular relaxation starts. So everything is thrown out. Okay. So our challenge is, in spite of the body's mechanism to reject the things, that Charlie has to implant itself. Stay. So this is the precision of your ET catheters. soft catheters negotiating catheters all under observation so whenever we are even transferring a fluid say inseminate abhi ideally inseminate kitna hona chahiye iui ke liye 0.4 ml abhi log kya karte the pehle thus thus ke 0.8 ml dalta hai zyada dalo to pregnancy zyada badhega actually it's wrong it will cause a multiferous effect the oocyte the, the material will regurgitate out and the oocyte the over, uh, uterus contractility will increase so much the bottle we had transfer will be gushed out plus when you transfer so much the material will gush into the tubes and there will be again a high chance of ectopics so body will definitely reject now in surrogacy what the rule is ke one thing should be of the biological couple you cannot say ke mai oocyte bhi bar ka leta hu sperm bhi donor ka leta hu upar se surrogate karata hu that is not allowed actually ladies eggs donor sperm and a surrogate tolerable dad sperm mother donor oocyte surrogate tolerable or mother's eggs dad sperm and a surrogate tolerable so there has to be one person of a third party and everything has to be absolutely documented documentation is absolutely necessary today they are very what you call it as law conscious kuch bhi hota hai to lawyer ka notice aa jata hai typical so you have to be very precise as the date wise i tell you an incident it was a medical related not with ivf there was a person who insisted to a doctor ke please do my little bit surgery today itself today itself the doctor said why they said no i want you to do it today the surgery was done 
it was some appendicitis which was also not essential then he told the doctor sir aaj ke liye ke liye kal ka date likh lo na ke maine surgery kal karaya tha doctor said why no 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 bas karo na he literally wrote it it was done yesterday after two months the police came knocking on the door of the doctor ke this person whom you did a surgery is a suspect in a murder okay and all the evidences prove ke he was present on that day only your proof that he had done a surgery in your hospital on that day is contradicting you got my point so how the twist and the turn takes place so please galti se bhi chalna to mera friend hai dikh den ek din mein kya farak padta hai no that sort of a thing it does interfere please so before in a sometimes in an and in infertility never be very friendly with the patients let me be very frank because what happens they are very friendly but suddenly when they feel that friend turns into foes the next minute so please no assurances no convincing assurances and always tell them a little bit of negatives right from the day one apun ko examination in the war who loved zoology we all hated chemistry and maths let's be practical right right kene so be guarded ke bhaiya isme to zara we are wishy washy so let us boost up our morale and somehow somebody in our group will be always there are ye to bahut simple hai tu kyu chhod raha hai are you take this tere paas scope nahi hai this was what we used to face when i and i done when i opted for chemistry but still i took up zoology and for zoology then well it was my passion it's like that but sometimes passion becomes a fashion also huh? so don't think the other way around anything else Oh, sir, so that's it. Those were all the questions for this session. Any other question? I'm on the net. I mean, no, not on the net. Please, sir, I'll give you the email addresses. If anybody is staying in the vicinity of the ICER, etc., you can visit the lab also for training session. Just visit casually, no enforcement. Aake glance karke jao. At least taste the pudding. Okay. So we meet at two o'clock. Oh, it's only half an hour left now. So I was just like mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just want to thank Vadya sir for being here constantly yes, throughout sir. this session. Sir, do you have any comments or anything to make before we end for now? You are giving me the draw symptoms. <laughs> I think uh, I think I think he is not there. He was there yes. till quite some time back. Yes. Okay. So I think I'll have to log with the same ID which was provided to me in the morning, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Fine. Sir. Okay. Yeah. So let's and hope the let's hope the videos will meet your expectation because they were they were done instantly for the students effect because in pandemic nobody could visit so I requested my CEO to be thora facility de do and he had helped me out and tomorrow also if you want some additional lectures on Sunday you can with new permission from your HOD or server we can incorporate two small talks also okay, okay. because I have a volumes of talks Chal, <laughs> okay see you by two o'clock thank you. we will be back uh, at two so you can just join back in here for everybody on the live too and here it's so if if you are suffering from hypoglycemia <laughs> okay fulfill yourself but don't set up yourself so much for the video sessions i will find you all sneezing <laughs> no chill out bye sir thank you thank you sir So good afternoon. Welcome back for the session. We're going. We're live now again. Yeah. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. See now, what we will be doing is now. Uh, I will be sharing the screen and showing you certain snippets, or maybe some are ranging from five minutes to fifteen minutes on the various aspects of an embryology setup. now they have not been ultra professionally shot so there might be a little bit glitches here and there i really request your pardon for the same but i have tried to synchronize them in a patternized manner as to how we progress okay fine So the audio can't be heard. 
Uh, the audio can't be heard. Audio, I think. Welcome into the sterile zone of the ART laboratory. Now this is exactly what I wanted to tell you where we are standing is a sort of a conduit area because in any laboratory the actual opening of the doors is not into the outside zone. There is a small conduit area in which there will be your scrub area, there will be your changing room and subsequent entry either into the enro lab or the OPU laboratory. This will be taken a step later but right now what I want to target is the structural formulation of the laboratory. Now you know that we had first labs which were plain civil work which were furnished with or which were decorated with marble styles or fancy stones just to give a nice effect but later on because of their toxicity or because of their uh, what I can say so epigenetic effects nowadays it is very much off the shelf the latest one and the most preferred one is the modular version now what is a modular lab it consists of sheets or planes which can be just pulled one beside the other they are either Galvanized iron, GISS, powder coated, sandwich puffed, laid amongst each other. They are airtight, they are soundproof, they have got smoothed edges, ease to clean, and this material will not be affected by the routine vigorous cleaning of the labs which take place day in and day out. Why? Because in the event of us using fancy marble tiles, now marble is calcium carbonate ultimately it will chalk off and it will keep on releasing small microporous amount of dust in the environment which won't be seen by the naked eye nor it will be detected quite that easily so the SPM content of the air will increase so in order to eliminate all this toxicity inducing substances lab setup is of very importance and this is of prime importance. You can have complete see-through glass. You can have half French window style. You can have complete opacity. It's like a wall within a wall. But still, we got to take ample care to ensure that whenever you set a lab, there is no seepage, there is no leakage, there is no humidity settling in the walls. So in a place like Mumbai, where there is heavy rainfall, I wouldn't advocate a lab on the top floor because of the leakage and the ground floor because of the seepage as Mumbai receives torrential rains. And the most important epigenetic agents are humidity, moisture, VOCs, COCs, sunlight, UV light and SPM, suspended particulate matter. So with this caretaking, the next step which I will be showing you is how to take care of the circulating air or the concept of air conditioning, humidity handling equipment. We go into the next mode. Yeah, I'm switching over to the next module now. Now the next will take care of the HVAC system. In the event of a lab setup, one of the most important parameter which is grossly misunderstood and misunderstood is the air circulation. Now this is of prime importance. So there is a pattern what we call it as HVAC system, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. In simple small IUI labs, this might not be holding much of a significance, but in extensive culture laboratories, air circulation, air handling, air filtration is of prime importance. 
because no laboratory manufactures or produces their indigenous air. What we are utilizing is air from the ambient atmosphere. So this air is pulled in, it is filtered, it is compressed, it is pumped into the laboratory to create a positive pressure, it is recirculated, then there is air exchange. So this needs an intricate engineering workmanship. Now to help you understand why this is needed, your air should be pure. A laboratory air is classified as class 1000, means it is 1000 particulate matter present per square feet of air. So this is what we do in QAQC as quality control, air parameter measurements or VOC measurement or SPM content measurement. This is really a backbone of your QAQC because the same air which will transfer through your laminar flows, which will flow through your incubators, which will be present existing around you when you open your culture plates, when you do your handling of gametes, when you do your culturing of gametes, inadvertently it can cause its toxic effects and it can be detrimental. So what is done is, in every laboratory, if this is the back wall, there is a separate room behind it, what we call it as the utility room. Now in this utility room comes the concept of positive pressure. Now what is positive pressure? Positive pressure means the working pressure in the actual laboratory is at a little high pressure so that in the event of any outside door being opened, the inner high pressure prevents the external air from jumping into the laboratory. Instead, the air from the lab will be pumped out. So it is like maintaining a partition or a current or a curtain of sterile air. This is to avoid any outside bread cross contamination from exterior to the interior. And how is it maintained? Well, it is maintained by having this positive pressure units. Now this is fitted over here in a separate room where there is a slight circulation of outside air. It is purified, it is passed through these tubings and it is pumped into the lab over here. So this is the inlet. These have got activated carbon, HEPA filters in order to ensure the air purity. Now second concept, what we call it as air exchange. Now what is air exchange? In every laboratory, we have got CO2 incubators. Each incubator has a 6% carbon dioxide in a compressed form or in a purging form. What is the percentage of normal CO2? 0.03. It is comparatively minuscule compared to the high percentage of carbon dioxide present in the incubator. So every time you open your incubator door, a high percentile of carbon dioxide is pumped into the lab environment. And if you have two or three incubators working in tandem, the percentage of carbon dioxide saturation in the close compact area of your laboratory far exceeds the threshold amount. And this causes many a times trauma to the working embryologist. There are stress, headaches, some sort of a delusioned mode. This doesn't provide a stress-free environment. So what is mentioned is or what is essential is that air turnover rate. Air turnover means in a certain stipulated time, the air present in the volume of your laboratory is circulated or it is known as air exchange. So the positive pressure which was over here, this air rotates or circulates through your room and it is sucked back by this return blower. Now this blower will suck in the air and there is a small blower machine present over here which will suck the impure air. So there is a continuous circulating current in the lab. Actually 10 circulations per hour are essential. The reason is what we don't want. 
we don't want the carbon dioxide saturation in the laboratory to exceed its permissible toxicity limit for the human being. So this takes care of the air circulation in the laboratory. But don't misuse this as this is the ultimate mode because for your in-house air circulation we have got another two gadgets what we term as coda filters or coda towers. The size and the capacity varies with the volume of your laboratory. They are also fortified with activated charcoal, potassium permanganate, HEPA filters because these are the three basic ingredients which are very much essential for purifying the air because what they do they adsorb the impurities. What does the HEPA filter do? It filters the air, they deodorize the air. So it is akin to your AquaGuard water purifier. So this takes care of the air entry into the lab. Your existing Coda Towers takes the care of the filtering of the air inside the laboratory and your HEPA filters in your laminar air flows, which I will be explaining to you subsequently, will also take care of the rotation air in the laboratory. So per se, the lab quality air should be approximately 100, I mean sorry, approximately 1000, pardon my saying so, the incubator air is 100. So I will explain to you in the next step, the intricacies of the laminar flow when it is used for an IUI setup or an integrated version when it is utilized for IVF setup. So now since this peripheral air quality was taken into consideration, now the actual air quality on your working table means your laminar airflow, which ideally provides the, it's like a carpenter's bench for embryology, because this is where the environment factors need to be meticulously considered. Okay, so we roll on to the next topic. Now our first entry into the andrology lab. Now our first entry into the actual embryological manipulations. That is andrology. For every embryologist, the first stepping stone is to learn the basics of andrology, to know the sperm, to master the seminology, subsequently master the sperm function test, the sperm wash techniques. So slowly, slowly all the modalities of sperm wash for an IUI, insemination during an IVF, capacitating the sperm or priming the sperm prior to the ICSI procedure is essential. So you know the sperm, you, may, you manipulate the sperm well, you prime the sperm well, and believe me, there is a 10 to 15% increase in all your ART technique results. So we step in gradually. So you're on mute. Yeah, so that was a very short stepping in process. So once we enter into it, it will be gradual introduction to the gadgets. <clears throat> Coming to the gadgetry of an andrology lab setup. An andrology lab setup and an IUI lab setup can always roll into one because this is the place where the sperm are analyzed, the seminogram is drawn, the functionality tests are done, the morphology and the various uh, functional tests relating to kinetomatics are done and gadgetry is equally important. So the first and I would say the most controversial gadget is the laminar flow. People always ask, what is the need for laminar flow in an IUI preparation? Now remember, IUI preparation incorporates media, incorporates handling of a biological sample, incorporates semen handling, 
layering, aspiration, mixing, loading of the catheter and the transfer or the insemination of the sperm rich aspirate into the sterile uterus of a lady wherein we need not have even a trace of contamination. We don't want to induce any complications post an IUI transfer because of our suboptimal sample. So the technique of sample making, the modus operandi of SOPs followed, the insemination technique all make a conglomerate towards a successful sperm preparation and subsequent transfer. So this laminar flow is of importance. Reason is every laminar flow will have the HEPA filters, the pre-HEPA filter and the main HEPA filter. HEPA filter is high efficiency particulate air. The ideal characteristic of a HEPA filter is 0.3 microns. So when you start your HEPA filter, this air will be sucked in from behind. There is a compression motor. It will pump in sheets of air in parallel sheets. That's why it is called a laminar. Laminar is actually a botanical term, flat surface of a leaf. And the pores of a lemma HEPA filter are such that no two air layers will intercept each other. So it will be a smooth uninterrupted curtain of air existing all over your working space. This can be modified. This is a compact one. To economize the space, you can have 4x2, you can have 2x2 depending upon your work area. But all the necessities, the microscope, the hot block, your chamber, your slides, cover slips can be all incorporated into a nice work area so that it eliminates the stress of the embryologist running or hopping skipping from one place to another. So besides being giving a clean work area, it also minimizes the stress for the embryologist. Now showing you the rest of the things we just run across and I will show you each and every gadget in details which is utmost and importance in the andrology laboratory starting with is a very good bench table microscope. Please see to it that this gadget is not compromised with because it is on this microscope you will be judging your sperm which will be used for analysis, which will be used for IUI, which will be used for IVF, ICSI, whatever the procedure be. Optics, magnification, resolution, very important. Objectives, 10, 20, 40 and 100. 10 for the general observation, 20 for the macular chamber or the sperm counting chamber, 40 for in-depth linearity and motility designation and 100x or oil immersion is for the stain smear. It should be having good condenser, a filter accommodation below to cut the intensity of the light, proper aperture and its manual light control and switch on switch off. This can be a trinocular mode wherein there is a third port over here where you can fit a camera with a Gaber card and take the images on the screen or this can be just a binocular one but this is your backbone of an IUI because what a human eye does unfortunately I have seen many a times the machines are not that much precise because it's the human eye sees and thinks over it so we can actually modulate or prime the sperm accordingly so unless and until the sample is not visualized or justified a gynecologist or an infertility specialist will not be able to justify what sort of treatment she has to undergo. Now the next gadget, the hot block. Now temperature maintenance is of prime importance for handling any gamete of the body. Now embryology is a play between two cells. The largest cell and the most sensitive cell of the body that is the oocyte. And the smallest and the most motile cell which is the sperm. We will be showing you a sample of both. Once outside from vivo to vitro, it has to eliminate the osmotic stress. It has to eliminate the environmental stress. 
and it has to eliminate the temperature stress because it is very essential for the sperm sample to be incubated at 37 degrees once it is post ejaculate collection. Hypothermia and hyperthermia both can be detrimental. Both can play havoc with the motility, both can play havoc with the linearity. So obviously your procedures of IUI or IVF are going to go for a toss if the motility is compromised. Because in every aspect of embryology what is done is we are just visualizing the gross morphology. We are just taking a photograph of theirs. There is a paucity of any mole biological test, biochemical test wherein by we can say okay, okay this test yields blah 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 results so this is an ideal gamete. To select an ideal gamete till date is in a limbo. To justify an ideal embryo worth transfer is still in a limbo. Though there are lots of modalities coming up, we have got time lapse, we have got this, we have got that, but ultimately all comes with a price. So coming back to our basics of IUI. So this is a very nice accommodation. We have got what we call it as our round bottom tubes. Here there is a semen sample which is incubated. There is a skin to skin contact. Aluminum is having a fantastic conduction of electricity next to gold and copper which unfortunately we can't afford. So these are blocks in which they are incubated and the incubation remains stable. It is used sometimes to incubate your media, to incubate the collected samples and even in an IVF laboratory it is to incubate your post flush follicle aspirates. I hope it's going okay. The most important gadget in the andrology lab or I could say in a comprehensive embryology lab is your basic bench microscope. Please don't compromise with this equipment because this is where you will be judging the male gametes that's the sperm. You will be judging their kinetomatics, their motility, the yawing and post staining of the slides you will be judging the morphology which is the key factor of assessing the functional capacity of the sperm. It can be binocular, if there is a third attachment, it can be a trinocular over which you can fit a camera attachment that can be subsequently connected to a Geber card on a screen where you can capture the images. Plus, as far as the clarity, the optics have to be taken very well care of, the resolution, the magnification is of prime importance. You have added accessories like what we say, the lower inbuilt filter. These are also costly gadgets. Yeah. I'm just skipping. I think some part has been a little duplicated. So I just try to skip that over. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The lenses are costly. It should be a one-man show handling and be very careful of cleaning the lenses. No abrasive agents, no harsh agents which can mess up the fungal coating of the lens. Ideally, there is a solution what we call it as a mixture of diethyl ether and absolute alcohol, 70 is to 30 or 7 is to 3 percentage. Delicately mop it up and after use, please take care that these are spring attachments in 40x and 100x. They have gently got to be mopped up because if they are not mopped up, the encrustations will remain and the subsequent observer will have a hell of a time in focusing because what is the essential part of 40x and 100x is fine focusing. So this will be used to do a spot analysis of the sample, an analysis of a post wash sample, reading of the morphology slides, because if the andrology concept is understood properly, then the gynecologist will be having something to think about it 
as to how to prime her mode of action, whether the patient is recruited for an IUI, for an IVF or for an ICSI. So this is the basic equipment which is of prime importance for you to judge the functionality of the male gamete. Now coming to the gadget number two. Once your sample is collected in a sterile wide mouth container, it is very essential that the plastic ware which is utilized in all of the gadgets are having zero reprotoxicity. They should be very much biofriendly. They should not be having any contamination factor to the gametes because remember what we are handling are the male and the female biological secretions and the gametes are encompassed in that secretions. So all this have to be mouse embryo toxicity tested, single use and throw, properly packed, sterile, stored in a clean, neat, non-contaminated room and handled very professionally. Let's take for an example, the semen sample which we have got over here. It is stored immediately post collection into this block, what we call as a hot block or a test tube warmer or a dry bath. The reason is every biological fluid or every biological gamete has an optimal temperature of activation and survival which is 37 degrees in this case. Once the semen is ejaculated out, it will maintain its kinetomatics, ideally at 37. High temperature, hypothermia, hyperthermia, both are detrimental. Both will mess up the motility. So it's of prime importance to see that temperature doesn't compromise the functionality of the gametes. Not only the motility concept, even the acrosomal receptivity and the acrosomal DNA content will be compromised. So this is a very important gadget. It will show you the functioning temperature. It will show you the set temperature. And there is a sensor over here, which will detect any change. Now suppose I take the sensor out and I hold it in the cold environment. You can see a drop in the temperature, 36.2. And that sensor being back in its place, it will regain its originality. You can use it for immediate warming of your media in case of a sudden emergency. These are anodized aluminum blocks. Fantastic heat sensitivity next to copper and gold. Perfect blocking. They can accommodate the 14 ml tubes with a skin to skin contact by conduction. Temperature is easily maintained. So, in an embryology lab, ideally, we use three of these gadgets. One in an ovum pickup room, one in the andrology lab, and one on the embryologist's table. Having said and done, the sample being harvested, the sample being helicoted, the patient's details being taken, the next step, slow interpretation of the sample, or what we term as spot analysis. Instant, check. The gentleman who has collected is always in a rush to go home. Well, we check a sample and then we go across. Going okay? Yes, sir. Fine. If Should anybody has any questions. Yeah, in in intermittently you can ask me, no problem. Shall I go ahead? Yes, sir. Once the sample is collected, now starts the process of analysis. Basic things, volume, color, nature and pH. Well, for the pH, what we do is we take our routine pH strips. The least count should not be that low. Start from 6.5 that is acidic and go till 9 that's the alkaline pH. As regards volume is concerned, you have got calibrated tubes because remember in a semen the volume is to be calibrated till at least 0.21 ml. What does it signify? The volume signifies the 
nature of secretion from the accessory glands the prostate seminal vesicles bulbo urethral a slight from the epididymis and slight from the testis now why are these intricacies necessary because these are very much important for an andrologist your volume your ph your nature whether it is normal or whether it's viscous will tell you the shape of the things which a semen sample will disclose in the event of a sample being viscous in that is in case of either a prostatic infection or seminal vesicle infection we do is a needling with a 20 gauge needle attach with your 1 ml bd syringes which is the absolute essential working tool for every embryologist gentle needling will make it a point to see that the sample of viscosity is broken down don't be under the misnomer that oh, we are needling it so we will traumatize the sperm the sperm will be damaged etc etc no 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 please when we do ex the diameter of the ex injecting needle is 100 times thinner than the 20 gauge needle so the question of trauma doesn't come at all and second thing people always argue is the toxicity of this rubber plunger please we are not churning the semen sample with this rubber plunger at the same time these are also ce tested gadgets so please the concept of toxicity has to be kept aloof as much as possible and of course prior to it please arm yourself by wearing these gloves sterile tissue paper gloves coming in various sizes small medium mini and large so every setup ought to have a tray with all the ingredients of disposables readily at their disposals which will compromise of the conical tubes which will compromise of the plastic transfer pipettes all of which are individually wrapped single use throw and sterile you have your round bottom tubes for certain procedures and also <clears throat> your permanent fixture gadget which will be your counting chambers because apart from motility you also have to be very important for a sperm count because that's the first question which anybody asks what is the sperm count the next parameter which will be coming is what is the motility the tendency to move because both of these in combination are responsible for a successful yield now what is the yield to fertilize a oocyte and which oocyte a very well mature prime oocyte which will be of course the forte of the clinician on the gynecological part because here what we are doing is we are handling and analyzing only the male gamete that's the sperm that's why it's called andrology laboratory and a raw semen sample will not achieve anything you have to prime it you have to capacitate it or what we term it as we have to wash it in a general way now what is washing washing is removal of the seminal plasma activating the sperm improvising a little bit of the acrosomal shape because various layers are being removed glycoprotein layers especially im channel activity is optimized and how it is achieved well sperm wash is achieved by utilizing your various media sw is sperm wash media which is nothing else but a salt saturated buffer in which hippies is there now what is hippies it maintains the ph so it releases the or reduces the osmotic stress so it maintains the functionality there are two techniques of a wash the swim up method in which only this sperm media is used or the second one what we term as the double density discontinuous gradient in which two gradients are utilized 40% and 80% depends upon the factory or the uh, supplier which sends you it may be 70 60 30 40 whatever it is they have to be laid one on top of the other by selective filtration either we harvest the sperm or depending upon the sperm nature normospermia normal sperm oligozoospermia less number asthenozoospermia poor motility teratozoospermia poor shape or a mixture of all oligo asthenoteratozoospermia what we call it as an o80 syndrome 
which is common in majority of the infertile males. There is also an another option which is there in which it is aspermia. Unfortunately, that's a different field altogether in which there is no ejaculate. Now, this won't be catered right now over here, but there are certain problems with males in case collection issues. So, an andrology lab also has to be armed with a small equipment, what we call it as a vibrator. This will assist the male in collection because remember, semen is not like blood that you push in a hypodermic and pull out the blood and straight away send it to an analyzer. It all depends upon the mental state of the patient or the male at that time. The trauma, the tension, the stress, the inhibitions. Now, what will you call it as an inhibition? Well, of course, he is going to manipulate, he is going to collect the sample. So, inhibitions will be there. You can't just thrust a container in a gentleman's head and say, come on, go and get me the sample. He is already stressed out. There is a situational stress, there is a functional stress, there is a performance stress. So, all these stresses have to be negated. So, this is where exactly counselling is of ideal importance. Because if you counsel a patient well, he is able to perform well. If he performs well, he collects well. If he collects well, the sample is good. If a sample is good, the interpretation is good. So, this is what I tell you. The media also are available in large bottles, in per sample size for an individual patient. Please store the media with respect. A separate refrigerator is meant only for the storage of media. Media has to be cooled, not frozen, not chilled. So it all depends upon the seminologist. How he reads the sperm, how he manipulates the sperm, how he processes the sperm. It is not that he has to go by the verbatim textbook methodology, okay, centrifuge at 1200 means 1200. There has to be a play, plus minus, on both the sides. Now, today we are having high-tech gadgets. Now, in this gadgetry, the most important part which you will be handling is the centrifugation. So, coming back to the procedural aspect, the main piece of gadgetry which is very essential is the centrifuge. Because in both the techniques of your sperm preparation, centrifuge is involved. In a swim up, in the initial part when the media is mixed, the pellet is formed and from the pellet, after it is layered, the motile fraction of the sperm will zoom up. And in case of density gradient, the two layers are kept one on top of the other. The sperm is layered on the top. It is centrifuge. The excellent fraction of the sperm gets pulled in to the two filtering gradients and the interfaces. So what is collected as a pellet is a sperm rich pellet, ideally good in the morphological aspect. And especially is of importance because this is a very effective method in handling OAT samples or samples having poor count and suboptimal motility. So the samples which are used for intracytoplasmic sperm injection, they are mostly harvested by the conical tubes and the density gradient method. Now coming back to centrifugation, you have to take care because in centrifugation there is what we call it as a centrifugal force and centripetal force. There are two issues to it. At RPMs greater than 2500, over 300 G, that's the G force. The samples are not prone to centrifugal damage. The sperm, the sperm membrane lysis doesn't take place. And even the ROS regeneration, when the centrifugation is done in moderation, is limited. But ROS, what we mean is reactive oxygen species, they are free radicals. 
which are dispersed out or which are given out by other obnoxious cells like the RBCs, the pus cells, many castes. Because when they are centrifuged, the centrifugal force takes a toll on the plasma membrane of any of the cell, it shatters them or it tears them and they spell out or they exude their inner content out in the media. And this ROS contaminate the complete length of the sperm, thereby compromising the fertilization potential. So be very careful of how you centrifuge your sperm, how long you centrifuge your sperm and how well you dilute the semen sample with the media in order to eliminate the seminal plasma. Because the way in which you eliminate the seminal plasma will be directly proportional to the capacitation which is achieved in the washed sperm. Now the same thing is taken care of during a normal relation or a normal intercourse is by very well estrogenized cervical mucus having a fantastic spin market because mucus is the nature's best way in which a sperm sample is filtered and the best of the best sperm are recruited which travel all the way from the vagina, cervix, the tubes and all the way into the fallopian tubes for capacitation. So what we are doing is our sperm media is mimicking the cervical mucus. And our centrifugation, incubation, layering, spinning, all these are the steps which help us get the maximum out of the original cohort of the semen sample. Because remember, ideally, as per the latest sperm guidelines, the sperm which are really functionally worth in all the aspects are hardly 4%. Morphologically, that's the biggest parameter. Kinetics, many can be motile, but a fantastic motile sperm with poor morphology is as good as a sperm not being present. Still, we are in a paucity to handle or recruit the best sperm. So when it comes to centrifugation, people always say they damage the membrane, they break the membrane. I agree. Overzealous use of RPM and G-force can compromise the sperm viability. So this was a modified uh, centrifuge in which we have taken care of the temperature also in the inner chamber. Now suppose I want to run the sample. I will just set and run. There are different programs and the last one is showing the temperature. Now here I can modulate the temperature as per my expectation and increase it to 36, 37 depending upon the inner chamber temperature because this will lead to a constant incubation of the pellet which will not compromise the sperm recovery from the pellet into the upper supernatant. Of course, technology comes with a price but still results have proved that post washed sperm sample in the sperm fuge or what we call it as heat control centrifugation has definitely improvised the activation potential and to a little extent active, uh, uh, improvise the kinetomatics of the sperm. Now there are certain characteristics which we cannot visualize with any of the technique. It's only when we dig out the success rates or we make a six monthly sheet as to what the success rates are and we compare it with a normal centrifuge which is of a simple one without incubation. It is just the RPM and the measurements and the parameters. Temperature, nothing. It is like an ambient environment. And last but not the least, when I say that the most important parameter lies is the morphology. What we do is we prepare a crude stain like how you can see of the semen sample and then we stain it with either of the techniques. There is a pap staining technique, papanicolo staining technique, there is a double uh, diff quick staining technique which is very fast. Principle differential staining as per the acidity or the basicity of the nucleus of the mid piece and giving a contrast the head, the mid piece and the tail and then distinction. We will be judging it in 100x but still this is not sufficient. Ideally 
a detailed, intricate, precise and accurate analysis is done as far as morphology is concerned is by CASA, Computerized Assisted Semen Analysis, though it's very costly. But still, the basic will depend upon the skill of the embryologist to prepare the smear, to stain the smear. So as I said, technology is on, on and on. There are also other techniques as far as sperm quality concerned, that's the DNA interpretation, DNA fragmentation test. That's the only test which is leading a little more into the in-depth of cell dynamics and their mechanism. But still, you till date can't detect an ideal sperm. Now the actual entry into handling of both the gametes. You will be surprised to know that till date, even WHO hadn't recognized IUI as one of the modality of ART. The reason why, because their argument was that ART. Hello. This is now actually the handling of the samples in case of IVF. So now we are positing into the intricacies of the ideal laminar airflow. And this slowly gadgets, we will be seeing certain sites on the screen, the certain tools which you are actually handling, the media and the other accessory disposables. Okay. <clears throat> or assisted reproductive technology is that in which both the gametes are handled from vivo to vitro and then the final product of conception that the embryos are returned back to the uterus where they came from. Well, they were right in a way but ultimately as long as even IUI provided pregnancy and a hope for the hopeless, it is now considered as a very simple, economical, non-traumatic avenue of ART, artificial repro reproductive technique. So now we come back to IVF, the nature selection, handling of the egg, handling of the sperm outside the body, in the incubator, keeping them both together, post priming, forming a zygote, two cell, four cell, morula, compaction, blastulation. So it is like retrieval survival, culturing and viability. This is how the progress goes. It's like an online continuing cell culture. Now today we ourselves should consider that we are also ongoing cell culture and we started when minus our age minus the nine months prior to which we were conceived. So we are still the ongoing culture which had started those years back. And the reason why, for God's grace or mercy is granted, we are continuing is because those gametes were the ideal ones, which culminated into a lovely embryo, which was handled carefully, transferred into a lovely, uteri a lovely receptive uterus, pregnancy, full term, healthy baby, the current scenario as to where we are. So coming back to the lab, the most important workstation, what we call it as, is your laminar airflow or a clean workstation. Now, how it is different from an IUI workstation? Well, this is an integrated workstation. In a shell, I would show you 
that suppose I start this, this will incubate the whole of the stage at 37 degrees. There is HEPA filtered air, there is pre HEPA filter on the back side 0.5 microns, there is a pumping motor and there is a main HEPA filter of 0.3 microns plus there is a UV plus there is a nice accommodation of SS incubated plate the entire surface area. So what it gives is it gives ease to the embryologist reduces his stress and also gives protection to the gametes from external environmental conditions which can lead to trauma. So once the first procedure of ovum pickup which is successfully implemented in the ovum pickup room the sample or the oocyte flushed aspirate it comes into the laboratory and there what is done is it is scanned into petri plates like this. So this is the procedure what we call it as scanning. Now how it is scanned the next most important gadget is this stereo zoom microscope SZ usually because in embryology there are three microscopes used one is the bench microscope for the andrology one is the stereo zoom for scanning handling denudation insemination grading and the third one would be the inverted ICSI microscope which will be demonstrated later the challenge behind this is suppose I focus now what you are seeing over here they are human oocytes. Now I change them into various magnifications and resolutions and the clarity because of those mirror effects. Can you see how the, it changes? So this is where exactly we have to scan and grade our OCCs or what we call it as oocyte cumulus complex. Now since this is not a running laboratory we cannot harvest the best of the best OCCs or rather we can't bring the OCCs to you. These are waste denuded eggs which we are here to show you as a display mode. Now in the event of us not having these eggs what many a times we give the students to practice are these glass beads. Now these glass beads also have the integrity of their own. So you can know how to focus them okay and then we can handle them. So the first part being oocyte recovery or the OCC recovery next is the OCC scanning and in that what we utilize are the various sets of disposables the large petri plates the small petri plates your center well culture dishes and the added paraphernalia of your BD syringes, your multiple dimensional flexipets of various dimensions which will be fixed onto these stripper handles. They can be manipulated, thumb manipulation. So they are good for handling them. And last but not the least, all with very good quality media and oil for close culture. So all this creates a fantastic environment to handle the oocytes, to negotiate them without causing them trauma. Because remember, they will be going in the incubator which is a mixture of three fantastic parameters temperature, ambient humidity and the percentage of carbon dioxide which will prime your media because the media which we use in sperm preparation will be different from this. Every media has got two subsets where an individual gamete is handled it is hippies based which just needs incubation. Then another media which is bicarbonate media. It is carbohydrates, proteins, amino acids saturated. So it needs a physicochemical change which is brought about in the CO2 incubator what we call it as media equilibration. 
in a certain time frame which is needed to bring about the change because the carbon dioxide the percentage carbon dioxide which infuses the conversion takes place and the ultimately the pH of the incubated or the equilibrated media is quite nearly the same as the intracellular pH of the cell which we are going to use because every cell has three areas intracellular extracellular and the membrane now this membrane is very sensitive the cell itself is very sensitive temperature variations environmental stress and toxicity epigenetic influence pH and the osmotic stress so whenever there is hypo or hyper osmolarity difference the cell will shell or shrink swell or shrink and this will lead into disruption of the cyto architecture present in the cell so under equilibrated media traumatic over equilibrated media traumatic external use for a long time traumatic so what these gadgets are doing is they are optimizing or enhancing the survival rate of the gametes now prior to that one equipment i just forgot to show you and that is a very important gadget what we term as a pickup needle now this is a very delicate thin slender sterile equipment which when attached to a vaginal probe will enter through the fornix flush out the follicles the mature ones of course 90% or 85% of the follicles post stimulation should be mature and it is the skill of the sonologist or the gynecologist to flush out many a possible in an atraumatic condition the principle is this i can show you over here that this is the tip of the needle or what i call it is the bevel now suppose i rotate this now can you see the spoon like structure i'll just focus it a little more properly yeah one second yeah that's perfect now can you see it scoops out it scoops out the inner part of the follicle it's like a curettage effect so your occ is scooped out the entire circumferential inner area of a matured graphene follicle and this is connected to a collecting tube one end of which is collect connected to an aspiration pump so the aspiration pump creates a vacuum so the vacuum will suck the occ from the follicle into which it is inserted and this is known as the oocyte recovery so ideally a skillful pickup a traumatic non bloody depending upon the follicular strength of the ovarian reserve depending upon the number of follicles which we see on day 10 because when the stimulation starts from day 0 to day 10 0 to 5 is the recruitment phase 5 to day 10 is a growth phase 10th day hcg 12th day pickup and you should get at least 8 to 14 well formed well primed occs which will be subjected to various media on this work station or what we call it as a laminar airflow or a clean work station because this will protect the gametes from the handler it doesn't protect give protection to the handler from the gametes so there are characteristics ideal laminar flow filtering capacity 99.99% the pressure of air at least 100 feet per second or how it is calibrated perfect heat maintained 37 degrees table top so what is there is air bond stress factors are eliminated and remember this doesn't mean that your embryologist has to work outside for extended period of time no the reason being gametes are from the incubator which are at 37 outside incubator outside 
embryology environment is 27 to 26 degrees which is cooler. So we don't want the temperature stress to immediately torment the OCCs or the gametes. Because in an oocyte, the first microorganelle which can be compromised is the spindle. The spindle is extremely thermolabile, extremely sensitive to temperature variations. So if a dish of an OCC is left out for more than 4 to 5 minutes under some optimal conditions, there will be permanent denaturation of the spindle and there is no recovery. So it is like we are inducing an artificial trauma. So this necessitates number one, your working condition, number two, your work table, the sharpness of your stereozoom, the clarity of the stereozoom, the resolution of the stereozoom, because it is over here you will be doing the selection, you will be doing the denudation, you will be doing the insemination, you will be doing the grading, you will be doing the embryo transfer loading. So this is your patent workstation. It has to be treated with respect. Cleanliness, of course, very important because this is SS muffed coated. Excessive scratching will erase the SS coating. So by chance, imagine if there is a blood spillage, what will you do? People just flood it with tons of alcohol. No, alcohol will fix it and it will form a cake of blood. What you do is first mop it up with sterile distilled water and then subsequently clean it with alcohol. But remember, don't use alcohol as long as any of your other dishes are outside of the incubator because alcohol itself is a VOC. So some people use a weaker derivative of alcohol, that's isopropyl. But nowadays there are a plethora of biofriendly reagents and the cleaning agents available. But all comes at a price. So starting from day zero, which is considered as a pickup time, over here you will do the scanning, you will do the grading. If it is ICSI, you will do the injection, subsequently transfer it onto another cleavage media. If it is IVF, you will inseminate, do the denudation on the next day. And depending upon your modus operandi, you will do either the transfer on day three, late day three, or a blast transfer that is day five. So this will tell you that this procedure per se incorporates use of gadgetry, use of proper media, right media at the right time because you have to follow a proper embryological time scale. Use of proper disposables, atraumatic working conditions, sterile lab environment, a very healthy incubator and most important the skill and the dexterity of the embryologist. Well, many times there is a distance between the cup and the lip. We have to work with what we get. There are chances of us whether a patient selection is not proper or the patient's gamete productivity is not proper. Very poor quality eggs. The stage will be metaphase 2 which is mature but the grade might be 3. Severely vacuolated, severely granulated, perforated, poor quality cytoplasm, cytoplasmic degeneration etc etc etc. Because remember these patients are the ones who are suffering from infertility. So these must be the hidden causes. We are not working like a magic box so that we can pull out a rabbit out of a magician set it every time we feel like. But what we are trying to do is that given conditions, we have to optimize our results. We are not there to ensure a pregnancy. We are there to enhance the chances of a patient getting in pregnancy at our very best, using the best of the best, proper ethical issues, a traumatic conditions and a systematic work pattern. Yeah, so any questions so far? This work pattern to explain it sounds a little boring, I agree, but these are all the important steps which you have to really precisely adhere to. Now all these preparations have to be made quite in advance. One day prior, what we call it as a preparatory stage. So that is what we term as a day minus one. Now day minus one is when you prime all your equipments, when you equilibrate your media, when you incubate them, when you keep a stock of the disposables, when you list the patient's name, check if he has his previous reports, compare it, 
check the HCG time which she has taken because the warm pickup is done ideally 34 hours after the HCG injection. So you have to call him accordingly. You have to call his uh, her husband for the semen collection. Paperwork should be ready. And your lab has to be in a pristine working conditions. So if you are doing cases in a batch, means four to five cases together, there is a lean period in between the batches. Now, during that time, calibrate, check your equipments, check your incubators, check your cylinders, check your liquid nitrogen levels, see the bulbs and the microscopes work well, order the fresh media, et cetera, et cetera. And as far as disposables are concerned, order them properly so that they are not less. At the same time, they are not in excess, though they have a long shelf life, but you have to store them properly. Only then you have all these things ready, then you will also feel the urge of doing it. Because when you sit at the laminar flow, you are not sure as to how many OCCs you will be getting in the aspirate. You may expect 10, you may get 15, you may expect 15, you may get five. So be prepared for all these things. But your culture condition should be the same, even if there is one OCC or even if there are 20 OCCs. So I think now slowly we will just roll on to two, three videos and then there is a Lixi demonstration. Fine. Any questions you can ask me or maybe at the end or feeling sleepy? No. Now the last part, but the most specific and the most result oriented part is the embryo transfer in IVF ICSI cases. Now it is like getting the conceptus formed with the gametes harvested from the body, culture them into the laboratory till day three or day five, day three being a six plus stage or early modulation and day five being a blastosis, whether it is hatched or unhatched. And then returning back to its parent body in the uterus, healthy receptive endometrium. So an embryo transfer is a lovely amalgamation of the work between two avenues, the clinical part and the embryological part. Because we have to grade, because there is a synchronicity between the developmental pattern of the embryo and the proliferating of the uterus. So this has to be taken care of. Now this is assisted by ultrasonography because nowadays imaging technology is sky high. You have got 3Ds, you have got 4Ds, you have got multiple visions, etc, etc, etc. You name it and the parameter is there on the magnifying screen. And vis-a-vis -vis your embryo growth pattern, vis-a-vis -vis the hormonal profile, especially the serum progesterone levels. So you have to be quite selective about the day of the transfer keeping into mind the consideration, the proliferation rate of the endometrium. So what we are doing is, we have to transfer the VVIP conceptus back to where it came from. Now this is quite similar to the IUI pattern wherein we were liberating the processed sperm into the uterus and the sperm used to go all the way till the neck of the tubes nestle over there meet the approaching rupture lucite, fertilize and the conceptus was rolling back into the uterus. So for that the delivery of the sperm we were using the catheters what we call it as IUI catheters which have a budding like this. Now you can see the budding at the side. Now this is where the sperm rich aspirate slowly oozes out into the uterine cavity a little below the fundus seeps in through the tubes, healthy receptive open tubes, functionally stable and open because remember all open tubes aren't functional tubes. There is a big difference between the two. Now this will be more on the clinical side so I don't want to burn my fingers right now. 
but when the sperm nestle over there and the egg ruptures the fimbria get activated it encompasses it the oocyte is attacked by the sperm the conceptus forms and the procedure starts it's a little one sided blinded approach but in case of an embryo transfer what we got to do is we are transferring a very healthy excellent proliferative embryo all the way into the uterus bypassing the vagina cervical opening external os internal os and uterine cavity so it is like we are selecting an area or a mattress suitable for a princess but still anything can annoy the princess because we are not knowing the receptivity of the endometrium there are lots of manual errors being creeping in human errors doing loading human errors doing transfer because the internal anatomy is not always made available to us so the golden rule is that whenever there is a procedure of any iui or et being done please do a process of mock transfer because you must be knowing that the uterus inside has got lots of anomalies sometimes cysts polyps inclusions misplaced os pinpoint os secretorial cervix adhesions so we are not knowing the inner kernel well so it will be like a blind end and we can't afford to waste our healthy embryos and the most important will be the proliferation of the endometrium triple layer 8 mm to 11 mm is supposed to be ideal receptive secretive proteinaceous secretions because this is where the embryo will settle embryo will nourish if it is not a blastocyst it will rupture it will hatch the hatched embryo will float in the uterine cavity it will oppose it will attach it will slowly denude the endometrium and then it will implant so the skill will all depend upon number 1 embryo selection endometrium grading embryo loading embryo transfer and most important after the beta hcg being positive a very properly implemented post luteal phase because this is where majority of the pregnancies are a little wishy washy remember these are all art pregnancies we are doing against the law of nature so there can be certain hiccups which we'll have to encounter on the way so all initially detected beta hcgs don't culminate into a take home baby now a take home baby rate is the most important yardstick or a parameter for any art laboratory what is usually done is post day 12 the after et the beta hcg levels when they come in the vicinity of 180 i mean sorry 80 to 120 fine happy after 2 days a geometric increase that will jump up till 4 to 5th week then a cardiac activity means the presence of a viable fetus in the uterine cavity so an intrauterine pregnancy the gestational sac the yolk sac the cardiac activity confirmed and then starts the take over by the placenta the placental cake so progesterone support i think is given till at least like 6 to 9 weeks till the proper formation of the placental cake now all will depend upon what the initial step by step negotiation of the external catheter into the uterine cavity so all your et catheters are divided into two parts one will be the external leading catheter or the negotiating catheter and the another one the spinal one is the loading catheter now i'll show you how it looks like now this is exactly how your external negotiating catheter will look like it has got a small bulbous head a vacuum like thing just to push the mucus a little away and the inner ones are multiple types this is a very simple one soft catheter this one has got a slight metallic tip so that you can justify this oh, shit 
yeah you can justify this metal part on your usg screen so you know to what extent has the catheter gone in the uterus it has to be placed a few centimeters away from the fundus so it doesn't have a recoil effect or majority of it doesn't gush into the tubes to cause ectopic or you have got still a modified version this in this case the entire inner tip is radio sensitive can you see the crenations over here so what does it do it will help us negotiate that to what extent has the catheter gone inside because this is the mid cavity or you can say area of maximum implantation potential another tip centrix howsoever best catheter you use the amount of fluid which you take during the time of et how you negotiate the push how well you maintain the pressure how well you negotiate the catheter outside and then certain parameters to be noted was the et difficult was the patient receptive was the patient frigid in case of she having vaginismus was the catheter coated with blood mucus did the embryos reflux back was the cervix to be held tenaculum was used sims or cusco speculum used and last but not the least was the et done under general anesthesia so these are all the fine points which you have to note when you complete your et so in case of god forbid some other qaqc issue you can come back to this and you can rectify your mistakes for the next et as i told you we are not there to ensure the results but we are there to maximize the probability of the patient getting a result <clears throat> yeah now i'll be just demonstrating on a module or what i call a simulator i'm sorry the thing now we are taking is cryo part yeah sorry after that there is a simulator part and then there are just two modules left biology well it's very important as far as art is concerned it is quite synonymous to what we term it as fertility preservation because initially fertility preservation was highlighted in cases in which unfortunately the person had to go in for a severe therapy like chemotherapy radiotherapy which would have caused a permanent damage to the gametes and there was no subsequent hope or chance for him to father a child so prior to the treatment the gametes were stored and the chief chunk was first focused to the sperm part because they were easily available and easily stored because of the bulk but as time went by innovations in cryobiology also reached a peak and now there are a number of methodologies available right from the slow freezing which was and now there is vitrification which is instantaneous fast proving excellent results but there are a certain loopholes the basic point is in cryobiology the best quality of the gametes survive the best so that's the first step that grade one gametes should be used because cryo is also used today in the absence of the male person number two where there are excess of gametes produced excess of embryos produced which are not used or a fresh transfer is made and the leftover of the embryos are preserved for subsequent use so the use is huge and most important for the males the semen banks so what we aim is in cryo the gamete should be recovered the gamete should survive the gamete should be viable and the dna integrity pre freeze and post thaw should be the same it's only when this functional integrity is achieved we can say that the cryo is successful now cryo in certain cells in very sensitive cells like oocytes and all were a little difficult because it was damaging the sensitive chromatin network and once the chromatin network is disturbed obviously there were some optimal variations there were discrepancies in the division in the embryo formation in the blastocyst formation but now these things have been streamlined these things have been taken care of 
And also as per the ICMR guidelines, even if you are a secondary or a tertiary center, which means even if you are running an IUI lab, you ought to be having a cryo facility. Now, what it means by a cryo facility, it is that you have to undergo two procedures of freezing and thawing, which are synonymous. But also there lies in a third underseen monster, which is the storage. You freeze well, you thaw well, but unfortunately there is a lacuna somewhere as far as storage is concerned. The result is disastrous. Because if you freeze 100 vials in a canister, the care taken for 100 vials or 1000 oocytes is the same for one vial or one oocyte. And remember, these cryocans are not a magic box that you put in anything and you get out a miracle. You freeze suboptimal ones, you get them back. So garbage in is equal to garbage out. So what needs to be done is recruitment of gametes, processing of gametes in freezing, proper storage, proper library effect and documentation because this is the most dangerous area where there is a high probability of the gametes getting mixed. And last but not the least, proper thawing before we deliver them to where they came back from. Avenues are large, equipments are huge, everything is available right from cryo gloves to goggles to alarm meters to nitrogen meters to trolleys to indicators to alarm sensors but as I said all comes at a price. Well maintenance well begun is half done. So over here when I say we are freezing in a generalized way, let me say what's freezing. Freezing means removal of the enemy number one, that's the water of cytoplasm. You eliminate the water of cytoplasm, you prevent the ice crystals formation. Ice crystal formation, hardening of the cell inside, rupture of the membrane or shattering of the cytoarchitecture. If the cytoarchitecture is shattered, subsequently viability is lost. If the cell membrane is cracked or a cryocrack or a cryofracture, Again, the vitality is lost. So in cryo, most important part, freezing with proper cryoprotective agents, which are of two types, mere coating. Some are coating and penetrating and dehydrating like propendiol, DMSO, or high molecular weight sugars are just coating. Mild penetrating and coating is glycerol, which we used in sperm. So we need to protect the gametes also from the toxicity of the cryoprotectant. So therefore, whenever you see any cryoprotectant protocol, it is exposure in minutes, very important. The molarity of the solution, very important. The temperature at which it works, very important. The amount which you should take in thawing, washing media, equilibration media, very important. Why? Because slightest evaporation of water from those media will compromise the osmolarity of the freezing medium and subsequent variations will be caused. Well, this if we go into detail, will reach a high peak above the stratosphere. So what I would like to first tell you is another important thing which should be available at the back of your hand is liquid nitrogen. The raw material or the, or the media in which the vehicle in which your gametes will be suspended properly and they will remain well for years together. If they are frozen properly, if they are submerged properly in liquid nitrogen, the nitrogen levels are monitored well, the cryocans are taken care of, proper library effect, excellent thawing procedure and subsequent delivery pattern. So nitrogen is what? It is a gas compressed under high pressure, turns its transition state from gas to liquid. Even when the pressure is lifted off, the transient state of liquid still is present, but there is a slight evaporation every day, even from your cryocan. So that's the reason we need to top them every third or the fourth day. Now what is so special about the cryocan? What is special is that they are just like thermos flask okay now you know what a thermos flask is outside is a metallic shell inside there are two glass jars only joined at the rim 
because all the three modes of transfer of heat, conduction, convection, radiation are eliminated. The same principle is utilized in our cryo cans. This is a dissected version which you get very rarely to see. This inner part is the main cryo chamber. Okay? This is made up of our usual anodized steel, aluminum or whatever metal it is. And this is known as the neck core. So this whole thing is joined only at the neck core. And this whole area is vacuumed. And this is the vacuum seal. So whenever you buy a new cryo can, please check the integrity of the vacuum seal. Because at no place is this connecting this. There are insulations of cork everywhere around. So first thing, check the seal. And next thing what you do is charging your cryo can. Charging means fill in nitrogen. Let the inner chamber come to super cooling. It will evaporate, evaporate. Close it. Check the level the next day. The steeper the dip, there is a leakage. Either over here or there are micro cracks in the chamber which is helping more nitrogen to evaporate than usually what it is. So when you are a starter or a beginner, there are two types of cryo cans. You see the TA. Now TA means transport. Now in transport, you don't have the facility of the canisters over here. Whereas in this biological ones, there are grooves in which you keep these canisters. And in the canisters, you are keeping your sample. So once the samples are in your canisters, what you have to do is, you have to mark them, you have to label them, and you have to see that the nitrogen levels are always above the frost line. Samples have to be dipped in liquid nitrogen. They don't have to remain in the vapors. So every third or fourth day or fourth or fifth day, depending upon your utility pattern, you have to top them. So I'll repeat the basics. Grade 1 gametes, proper documentation, proper SOPs for freezing, SOPs for thawing, availability of liquid nitrogen, and maintenance of liquid nitrogen. That's very important. So there has to be a very specific logbook for your cryo samples. Whatever are frozen, whatever are taken back, what is the balance and in case if a patient wants them to be discarded, well, with a consent and a permission and a signed seal, you can discard them. A little bit of briefing on the inside of the canister. Now each canister is like this. It's like a milk can. Now can you see this black and this is normal anodized aluminum. Now this is known as the frost line. The samples always have to be maintained the liquid nitrogen level till here. So this much area always has to be submerged in the liquid nitrogen. There is a maintenance level accommodation hole. So this will maintain the level even inside. Right? Each has got its carrying capacity because we have a lovely plethora of accessories. Starting from cryo vials. Cryo straws, cryo cassettes, cryo canes, okay, and of course those small semen vials, capacity ranging from 1 ml to 2 ml. Then for the laboratory purpose, you can have for the safety of the embryologist, cryo gloves, cryoprotective clothing, goggles, ultra safety, a cryo alarm, and last but not the least, a very well maintained ventilated space in which you will keep your cryo can. Cryo cans are never kept in closed lock and key rooms because every day there will be a slight evaporation 
of nitrogen even from your closed cylinder and this what it will do it will saturate your room with nitrogen vapors and nitrogen has a capacity to displace the oxygen from the room so when a person steps in he will feel asphyxiated or there will be temporary anoxia he will gasp for breath and there can be severe problems resulting from it apart from the trauma of a nitrogen spillage and a nitrogen burn because we are very well aware of the linden frost effect so of course the vehicle nitrogen is safe provided it is handled safely and the gametes can be preserved for a new time of frame if they are maintained well if they are preserved well and if they are thawed well still gametes are gametes we cannot ensure a pregnancy we can enhance a pregnancy follicle retrieval ovum aspiration is the most important step as far as ART is concerned because retrieval of OCCs is not all that easy as retrieval of sperm sperm can be retrieved in a very simple way just by masturbation at any time they are much in quantity so well, a little wastage here and there doesn't make much of a difference. But as far as oocytes are concerned, they are less, they are very fragile and we have to go interventional to aspirate them. It's a procedure done under general anesthesia in a pickup room. So this makes it a little more traumatic, a little more challenging. And what is needed is the skill of the radiologist or the gynecologist because here a multiple avenues are needed first considering the ovarian reserve the number of follicles because at every step there is a reduction even when follicles are monitored there are chances we miss a few follicles here and there because ovaries are mobile labile structures there is a chance we may count the same follicle twice some follicles may just escape our attention. When we do the pickup, we miss some follicles. And out of all the aspirated follicles, some follicles get traumatized. Ideally, it's the lead follicles which show up very nicely on the screen. So a gynecologist or a sonologist will always target the lead follicles first. Because each graphene follicle has a lovely capacity of 3.5 to 4.5 cc of follicular fluid which is straw yellow color. Unless and until it is small or traumatized, you will get a blood rich aspirate. So in our ART program, there were requests by many gynecologists or clinicians that please also take a course for clinicians. So we had a course in which there was an amalgamation of lectures, interesting cases and this gadget which we have is known as an ovum pickup simulator. It exactly mimics what an ovum pickup is. So let's imagine that this is a patient. This is the vaginal probe. This is the guide. And this is your ovum pickup needle. Okay? And this adjustment is that this is a setup the tube and this will be connected to a OPU pump. The pump being set on, the pressure being executed, vacuum being created, this vacuum will flush the follicle or flush the OCC from the follicle in the process which I will show you now. So this has a similar diagrammatic representation of the ovary. And it's like an examination. It tells us there are 15 follicles to aspirate and there is a time frame. Also, it mentions how many have aspirated, how many are compromised. Then there are manifestations of blood vessels. 
then by chance if we touch it there is an intraperitoneal bleed so you have touched the follicle you have touched the blood vessel it's compromised you start the procedure again so let us run a mock of this procedure Now, you see, as I turn the probe, you see these follicles? This is exactly how your ovary will look with the follicles. These are all mature follicles, big enough. So the bigger the follicle, the larger the follicular content, the greater is the chance of an OCC present in them. Now, this is how your initial ovary would be screened. Now, can you see this part? Now, this is a blood vessel, the iliac artery or the iliac vein. Now this should not be traumatized. Now as I would go in, I would just fix it to a certain thing like this guide wire. Now what does this guide wire show you? This guide wire is an indicator line which will be coming on every sonography machine. That it will tell you place the follicle in the line and then keep it steady and then slowly see your needle coming in. You see the follicle will puncture, it is now ruptured and now I pass the pedal, the follicle collapses, can you see it? Now I go down to another follicle, focus it in the pattern, oh I traumatized it, so here comes follicle compromised. So whatever aspirate I collect, it will show in the tubes. So this is an indicator on an examination, how quick, how nimble and how smooth the aspirations are. Because the most important part is some people do like it's a barbecue type of aspirate. Go one to follicle, another follicle, third follicle, fourth follicle. Or some people what they do, they do the billiard stack, side, 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 side. Now the skill lies in as to how quickly the follicles are aspirated, how clean is the aspirate, and the chances of a oocyte in a follicle unfortunately is not the cup of tea of a sonologist. Because he is not sure whether these will have an oocyte inside or not. Because they have internal granulosa cells which will keep on secreting estradiol, irrespective whether the presence of OCC is there or not. So the basic idea is how to retrieve the maximum number of follicles or how much to puncture the maximum number of follicles. Because once the follicle is punctured, it will collapse and ultimately what will be left back is the corpus luteum. So we will just demonstrate one more. Now see this is all opsy. When I touch a blood vessel, this thing comes over here. Session compromise, a blood vessel has been punctured. So what I have to do, I will have to start the session again. Yeah. So everywhere, before the pickup starts, the gynecologist will judge the ovaries. He will see how many follicles are there. Sometimes if he sees huge bundle of follicles, just like a beehive, it is like the patient has gone into ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And that time it's a little wishy-washy because more the merrier. No, that's not the case. Quantity and quality don't go hand in hand. So at the back of the mind, the embryologist also should remember if there are lots and lots of follicles, he retrieves them, but all of them won't be of an excellent quality. I'll just demonstrate one, though of course my skill is not all that perfect in this, but first you target it, okay, it comes, it punctures, okay, it has punctured, I press, retried one, okay, we go, I go to the next one, okay, like this, I have to see that I cover each and every follicle in the ovary. It's like complete aspiration. Now there may be multiple tiny tiny small ones. It is not necessary that you flush out all of them. If there are very tiny ones, they will be non-productive or there will be a very high chance of metaphase 1 or GDs. So there will be a communication or a dialogue between the embryologist and the sonologist or a pickup specialist or a gynecologist. They will say how many you will try. Suppose she was targeting 15 and the embryologist has retrieved 12 or 11. They say, okay, now I'm stopping because I don't think there is chance to keep on prodding the ovary for more and more smaller ones. 
because the more and more smaller ones are penetrated, the more and more bloodier or mucusy the secretions will be. And whenever you see a bloody secretion or a mucus secretion, the chances of your metaphase one will be quite high. So, inadvertently or in a nutshell, I would like to tell you that a clean, healthy, neat pickup is definitely a positive shape of the things to come. Yeah, now the last two videos are left. The introduction to the ICSI machine and the actual visualization of a mock ICSI procedure. Okay? Because unfortunately, we are not a running laboratory, we are not associated to a clinic, so we can show the actual process of embryo transfer. Though there are clips and videos available, but then they could be shared later on. Let's think of an incident or a case wherein a couple walks in infertile and it's detected they are having severe male issues, male infertility, sperm problem, oligoesthenospermia, oligoesthenoteratozoospermia, where the situation will be that the gentleman has a very few pathetic sperm but he still has sperm so you cannot brand him azoospermic nor you can opt for totally a donor semen sample. In that case what to do? Well, with the methodologies and the tests available, we can do a battery of tests first to see that what percentage of his sperm are nearing normal because in case of OAT or in case of severe male fertility problems, the chances of getting very good sperm are quite less. It is not only the case of sperm, sometimes in case of ovulation also where the lady just has two or three follicles, suboptimal, common sense will tell us that IVF is not going to work. So in such cases, what we are going to do is we are going to manually inject the sperm in an egg. So this is what set the term as micro manipulation. We are not only manipulating the egg, we are also manipulating the sperm. We are selecting the best sperm or I could say we are selecting a devil from amongst the devils. We are priming them well. Our selection criteria definitely magnified because of this inverted microscope whose magnification is a little higher. And we already have a crude idea that even in this OAT sample, there will be existing some near normal sperm which have to be experimented with. So this was the ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. 93 onwards the discovery was there. It holds good in cases, majority in case of male infertility. Because even if a gentleman has a few sperm, you can't force him for donation. He has got every right ethically and morally that he uses his own gametes. Unless and until some of them are, path are pathetic enough that we know that it's not going to just be of any use to him. But whatever be the scenario, you have to see that this gadget helps us in trapping, catching a single sperm and inserting it into the oocyte. So intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Now this is the ICSI machine. Now basically it consists of two parts. This is the inverted microscope. This, this and this, the white part. This part this part and all these paraphernalia of gadgets comprise of the micro manipulator. Because micro manipulation means moment in the hundredth of a millimeter. Very sensitive. Handling the smallest cell, handling the most fragile cell in a most delicate manner. That's the key. So what we have here is an array of tools which will facilitate moments a little crude, a little fine, a little delicate, a little meticulate. So this is divided into certain areas or sectors like this will be your course manipulator. This has got up down, 
you can go forward this will be the fine manipulator with those joysticks where you can see the manipulation is in the minutest microscopic scale then these are your delivery tubes which are going into your tool holders so these are your two tool holders into which you will be putting in your two important tools the holding pipette and the injecting pipette which are available separate you have a special dish to prepare in which in droplets of hippies media because they can withstand osmotic stress for a longer time you are harboring the good quality OCC I mean oocyte the denuded oocyte you are preparing a sperm droplet in the center you will be capturing the sperm you will be immobilizing the sperm you will be holding the oocyte and you will be gently injecting the oocyte now to take care of the optics you have got is the lamp source or the light source you have got are the pre filters the pathway of light will be like this straight going down you have got the condensers you have got the aperture you have got the Hoffman optic system because this will give you a raised picture usually when we see the photo of an embryo we see it like a disc but actually it's a three-dimensional ball and in this case the object remains steady what changes the focal length is the adjustment of your eyepieces which are down there it's inverted that's why it's called an inverted microscope the light ray travels from up goes through them all the way down comes into the eyepieces a fraction goes into the camera which is captured onto the screen so this is how the dynamic works now to take care of certain QAQC you have got an incubated stage over here and the environment also right now it's an open system but subsequently we'll show you a closed system chamber whereby the peripheral stresses are also taken care of so when seen on the monitor a good lamp house amount of the light incident on it the filters to cut off the intensity and these are all first crude adjustments fine adjustments holding needles injecting needles menu, uh, menu uh, making of the plate and then negotiating your gametes so with this we will show you as to how first the sighting of your tools will be the holding part of the egg or the holding needle and the injecting part that's the injecting needle from which a live demonstration of XC will be shown to you Yeah, now you will be showing the last video in which an actual XC is performed and the XC is performed by none other than another of your old giant alumni. He was in the biotech department. His name is Shridhar Gaitunde. He had also taken embryology. He was with me for a healthy five years. Now he's doing a little bit of freelancing and also assisting me in my teaching courses. Okay, so what you will be seeing him is him doing it and we'll be seeing the whole procedure on the screen. See now he has yes. See now he has focused both the needles. The left one, which is a little thicker. Yeah, he see the focus? Perfect. Now that's where the oocyte will be held. And the right side one, which is very thin, that is the injecting needle. So these are the two tools. One is for the oocyte holding, and one is for the trapping of the sperm and injecting of the sperm. So the first thing is just shake them both a little bit. See, when he manipulates like this. He will have to see, so this is known as the needle alignment, needle fixing and needle alignment. Most important, they should be quite quite, quite in a linear way. So when they touch each other, it should not be that they are in different planes. Because if they are in different planes, the oocyte will shift. Now what he has to do is, he has to negotiate the air pressure in the holding needle. So now he will just show it to you. Now this is what is called micro manipulation and see at this time he is using 
this fine parts. The crude manipulator is now no longer used. Only the fine manipulator is used. Correct? Now you see the bevel. The bevel of the injecting is also very sharp and pointing because it has to break the ulema in a very atraumatic manner. And at the same time, the holding needle is flat. It has a cusp-like thing. So it will suck the egg and hold it in its place. So there is vacuum created when he will handle these two parts. This part when he turns, it will negotiate the pressure of the egg and the other part which is hydraulic, it is filled with oil, whereas this is pneumatic, it is air column. So air is a little crude, so the oocyte is trapped and the hydraulic is very fine because he will be trapping the sperm inside it. Now what he will do is, he will just place the ICSI dish, focus the ICSI dish and show you a mock ICSI. See now he is slowly See now the droplet is placed Yeah so skill needs to be taken in which you have to first focus the droplet Yeah Now he is changing the magnification, so we will see a magnified image of it. See, now you see the bevel very well of the injecting needle. Now what he has to do right now, he will be first finding the sperm, okay? Once he finds the sperm, now look at the sperm, look at it's moving, it's motility. See slowly, slowly it's moving because there is a droplet of PVP, what is polyvinyl pyrilodone, which will reduce the motility. Now slowly he will crush the tail. The tail is manipulated because there has to be a tear in the sperm membrane. See, that's it. Now slowly this immobilized sperm will be aspirated into this needle. Correct? Now look at the finger, this moment, he's slowly aspirating it. You see the jerky moment? Yeah. See, he's very micro. This is micro manipulation because it's so gentle. See, he's gone inside. Right? So it is aspirated in and now slowly it is brought to the tip. Now we focus the egg part. Yeah, there is the oocyte. Just focus it a little clear. I'll explain to them the parts. Fine. One second, sir. Now this is the oocyte, the cytoplasm, the perivitelline space, a thick zona, and this is the extruded polar body. So one polar body which is extruded means it is a fertile egg. It's a mature egg. Now what he will have to do? He will draw this close, hold it over here and inject from this side. See there comes the holding pipette with the pressure it will be sucked in. Yep, you see the pressure? You see the pressure giving me over here? So it is held in its place. Now slowly will go the needle 
inside the ulema yeah the sperm is drawn as close as possible you can see the sperm moving over here some of the cytoplasm is aspirated back into this needle so the mixing takes place over here and slowly this whole thing will be pushed back into it now one care you have to take that when you hold this egg the polar body should be either at 6 o 6 o'clock or 12 o'clock done now he has withdrawn this and slowly release the pressure you can see you just rotate the outside see it's rotating can you see the whole spherical structure like a ball it's rolling so this is the three dimensional and what assists us your optics your Hoffman modules so it's like a ball which is being rolled now after this injection it will immediately go into the cleavage media because cleavage media will start the zygote formation also and the division because it contains salts of calcium magnesium and EDTA which will promote the cell wall division because now cytokinesis and karyokinesis will commence so this will start dividing 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 so the embryological time scale 18 to 20 hours fertilization 25 to 27 hours 2 cell 38 to 42 hours 4 cell 48 to 54 hours 6 cell plus and then starts the process of geometrical increase in the number of blastomeres which will give you a morula a compaction then the three stages of blastocyst so if you do the process on monday your blast will be ready by friday evening or saturday morning fine we are doing it again oh that's it fine so this is ICSI. so you can just take it in a standalone position the clipping also Okay, so that was it, right? So I think you are much affected by the sleep-inducing endorphins post-lunch. I could make out from majority of your cases. Anyway, but that's the way it is. That's the way I always say that the procedure aspect is very little. The actual procedure is very little, but to implement it, to modulate it is a Herculean task. You have to understand it is not simple like many times embryologists are just termed as glorified technicians because what they do is without knowing they just do add mix centrifuge layer and finish they don't have any backup plan they don't know why do we utilize when to utilize how much to utilize what to do in case of an sos so there are many things to be followed now, unless and until you don't understand the intricacies of the gadgetry, the utilization of your media, the importance of cold chain, you won't be able to do this. Otherwise, it is Ram Barosa. You do it and you finish it off. Whether the result comes or not, sometimes the blame game starts. Poor gametes, poor media, poor incubator, poor embryologist, poor condition. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it is all pulled together, which makes it very challenging. So you need to have some medical knowledge, you need to have some anatomical knowledge, physiology, optics. It is, it is huge. Just to understand the microscope, this, even the stereo zoom or the inverted microscope of your ICSI, you won't believe me, to understand the ICSI machine takes a goddamn bloody month because there are so many knobs and screws and prisms and delicate stuff and we are too scared to touch it. If something is stuck, it will be about 15,000 years. Because the thing is, everything is important. So I tell people, okay, there are a few things which you always have to keep duplicate in a laboratory. Most important are the spare bulbs of these microscopes because these are not over the counter available. They are very specific thin filament tungsten bulbs. They have to withstand certain wattage and then a backup centrifuge. If a centrifuge goes fat, nothing can be done unless and until you tie it to a tube and rotate it. Then next is, the backup cylinders and regulators. Now, day after, when there are, I think, some videos prior to that, I would like to show you a small clipping of different incubators, which we have in our institute, because we also have our own calibration plant. Then there is a small clipping on the incubator that's basically the heart of it. 
and then if time permits i'll be showing you one presentation on the cervical mucus which i have missed which is very important part of the female part as far as reproduction is concerned maybe thoda kuch video clip kar dunga and then subsequently we'll bring curtains down any questions in this or it's tea time what say i think the videos were quite like broad like it, it was like so properly put together that we could understand what was happening throughout yes now that was the reason now this is exactly how we undergo in our training now this is a training of 5 days put together in one clip because every aspect is individualized right from the time your sperm preparation your wash techniques your cryo techniques then your handling of oocyte the loading of et catheter understanding the machine how to prepare a dish because as i told you everything is easy as long as the other person is doing it but once you try to handle it's a, it, it's a challenge it's a thrill you got my point and the first part why i always target upon embryology is andrology because that is the first stepping stone and howsoever people grade are ye to junior hai aajkal ka bachcha hai but actually speaking the juniors have more knowledge than the so called old fossilized seniors you got my point and in every profession there is a discrepancy the senior will never allow a junior to come in because everybody fears for his pay package ya agar usko sikha dega to main kya karunga you got my point so that is always uh, that that has everywhere that's the reason even the best of your best teacher will not be sharing the minutes and the finest of tricks to the students you got it but the thing is you should be completely open clarity see what you are doing is not some gospel it has been done prior you are just mimicking it and when will you practice and when will you professionalize it for three things practice practice and practice now you get enrolled in the clinic fine the biggest problem is why actually embryologists are not recruited full time because if is an initial center is there i always tell the gynex can i you start only if you have a very reputed name as a gynecologist since 4 5 years and second in your opd say out of 10 patients you have got 6 to 7 patients for infertility then you stand the chance of getting lots of footfalls now 15 to 20 years prior there used to be very isolated centers scattered nowadays every village or a small township has a center and usually why do many gynex set up centers when some are deeply in passion with infertility some love it some start because they have a little vintage position or i mere pas lab nahi hai chalo main lab dal deti hu and thirdly people set up because the neighbor has a center you got it so not to be left out are uske pas center hai mere pas nahi hai to set up a center today is a child's play but to maintain and run a center is a herculean task because we can provide everything else but patients to collect the patients and patients cannot be randomly picked up initially people hoard patients by the tons but to but to filter them out because there is always a drop rate initially out of enthusiasm 20 would say yes sir idf ko khush ho jata hai next question mere paas 20 patient honge ultimately when you tell the price 10 then when you start stimulating all patients don't behave well some go into ohss hyper stimulation that's also life threatening some don't respond at all some don't produce follicles so majority of the cycles have to be cancelled so there is approximately 15 to 20% of cycle cancellation so all these nuances are there you got my point so that's when the people say kare bhai mere paas cycle nahi hota hai mere kya karu na bole cycle nahi hota hai to wo embryologist ki galti nahi hai you have to pay them she is their full timer it is not like if a certain product is not marketed in the market properly the factory closes down or they don't pay their employees bhai sa thodi hai now a classroom will be run only there is one student and one professor or there are hundred students and one professor it doesn't make a difference it's not like a one student for one professor aisa to ho nahi sakta correct then everybody would jump in for teaching profession right so this is exactly the 
I would say not exactly nuances, but challenges. Now the concept is, you know what, as you younger generation, suppose somebody plans to take up embryology, but even when you want to go abroad, let's see, because we have been holding our yearly conferences first, pre-COVID times, a very international conference we used to hold amongst our ER society, where we used to invite professionals in infertility from embryology viewpoint all over the world, from Cleveland, from Yarrow, from Scandinavian countries, top of the line, professionals, that should we have a good healthy library effect of all of them. And they also run their institutions. And I think two or three uh, students from your giant college only, I had uh, sent them abroad. One was, I don't know, her name, but she had gone to UK under Joyce Harker. Now she runs the world's best PGD clinic and embryology. So, you know, we have got accreditations many where, but it is not an overnight a master. You have to struggle. You know, said that he expected seven figures. The, the, the stratosphere is the limit and work experience underground. <laughs> Unless and until you don't have work experience, who the hell is going to recruit you? Now you can jump in for a PhD where you have got zero lab experience because all foreign universities, howsoever they may be in PhD mode, would ask for your laboratory experience. Even as the most junior of junior, so my request is all to recruit in the beginning. Work for seven, eight months. Let yourself be victimized. No doubts about that. But you will earn at the end of the day. I had worked as a junior embryologist because foreign universities don't consider your degrees which you hang merrily on the wall. Now, in this COVID times, you must have seen numerous courses been offered online, even embryology courses. So, some log chapte, this certified embryologist, they say, yeah, online course. Online embryology course, if you would have visited two or three of my talks like this, even I could have given you a degree. You know, so the, shape, so the shape of the things to come is quite huge. Of course, the choice is yours. Time is there. But at the same time, previously what used to happen, a center used to spring up maybe after two years in one locality. Today, you relax, center shuru karunga, parso shuru karunga, center it happens in many places. And another thing is, people don't advertise themselves. It needs a strong marketing. Even in a place in Mumbai itself, I don't want to name it where, it was a fantastic center. But the people in that vicinity were not aware that this corporate hospital also has a fantastic IVF center. Why? Because those people were thinking, marketing the paisa lagega, or IVF pe paisa thodi utna aata hai compared to other surgeries. So it was starved of funds. So ultimately, center closed down. You know, it's like that. And the irony was the last match which the center did, that should, four cases they had done, all were positive. So one of the visiting doctor had written, is a charo char pregnant, could be center ban? You know, it was a statement which he had made on the group. So such things also happen. Okay. So because it is it is a risk worth taking, like every profession. You enter into it, you don't know where you end. But for research orientation, you have to go across abroad. You know, opportunities are there, but the luck factor. And you know, sometimes good luck comes walking and bad luck comes on horseback. Right? So your glorified degrees, your grades, your stamps, your authorities, first class, second class, third class, kuch it is actually work experience, your skill. Because when we started, there was no media. We used to use media by the metallers balance. At that time, we were using MilliQ system, water filtration. In 1994, MilliQ system was costing 1,20,000, which was an astronomical amount. I was so sorry, pani ke liye lakh rupiah, you know. And today, when in certain cases we use missionary water, mother will be tension that I asli I cannot believe. You got my point. So even missionary, you won't believe. You see, you see the number of missionary, what you call it as a what you call a counterfeits available. Missionary, missionary, unless until you are not specific, you get carried away. So 
there are certain tips and tricks which you really have to challenge yourself with. Provided you are of a strong metal, provided you have inclinations, and provided you are there to waste some more time. Now, that's what I always suggest that some people immediately after ESC they come. Okay, sir, you want to go into MD? I said, no, please don't do that. Do an MSc course, either in a life science or any other field, so you broaden your base. Because tomorrow, God forbid, you are not able to go into embryology. You have got some other fields in which you can diversify. But if you are immediately BSc and go into embryology, and then after many, many places, when you are youngsters, there are two categories of youngsters. Those who are ready to work five hours or six hours every day with an X amount of pay scale for the rest of the lives. They, they, don't, they, they don't mind being dormant. As long as they get a monthly pay packet of 20 per 35,000. But there are some who immediately call me, sir. You know, they are ready to jump over. But then the irony is sometimes when we send or recruit people to other running centers where there is a fantastic work potential, but the pay package will be less. You got my point. So if you really want to progress, you have to work hard, simple as that. And you have to diversify into various fields. Fine. So I think this will be best discussed. That should, when time permits, we meet face to face. And then, of course, you are most ready to visit me. Any other questions? You can feel free to ask me till we meet on Sunday. I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's uh, Saturday morning. What time? I think it's 10.30 again, the same time. Oh, it's 9, 9 a.m. 9, 9 a.m. 5.30. No, it's 10. We start at 10. Oh, sorry. Decide to tell me. Okay. So I will just try to modulate some talks huh? and some, I think maybe the, the procedures may look a little draggy at times, but I think I'll just 45 with some two nice informative talks. So once it is there, it, it will still, it will just start to bubble you up further and to enthuse you more into it. Because at least now you will be aware if I want to enter into this field scenario, it is literally an untouched. Many of them have not heard embryology is also a profession. Believe me, in a foreign country, embryologist is treated like a god. He is given more respect than a surgeon over there. Any decision making, they talk to embryologist, but provided, you got my point. So we cannot claim that we know everything. Even I don't know anything. Every day is a learning curve. Every day new thing. But believe me, technologies are towering, skipping every day. But the basics are remaining the same. The basics of sperm preparation, egg maturation, your lamina flows will be increased. Your HEPA filter quality, your incubators will be sensors, they will be increased, thermal sensors, that, uh, uh, HR sensors, Technology gallops, gallops, and gallops. Basics will remain the same because neither is the egg going to change nor the sperm is going to change. But with the increasing stress factor on the humans and the day-to-day -day procedures, our gametes are inadvertently affected and we don't know till we get ourselves tested. Now, there should not be a condition that before marriage, no, I want to see your semen analysis report or I want to see your sonography of your follicles. I'm not going to say that, right? Correct? But sometimes inadvertently it happens. Okay, we try to do this and we come to a conclusion of this. Like in COVID times, many people did the HRCT of the chest and they found I love that heart may be problem. It has happened. You got my point. So these are collateral problems. Fine. So we take a break for today. Thank you very much for hearing me out, bedding me out. I'm sorry if there is some any problems so, or some lacuna. You know, uh, and again, I'm not trying to put forth a Thank you. Yes, Thank sir. You very Thank much. You. Yes, sir. What patience and, you know, going for such a long uh, marathon run. I, I'm sure, but all the students were there, you know, and so they have learned a lot. And what you said, rightly so, no matter the technology can change, but the basics will remain safe. Absolutely. So if your fundamentals are strong, yes, sir. you can be anywhere and whatever you want to. This is what is lacking in the new generation. They don't want to be in the fundamentals and the basics. Right, they right. just want to, you know, there are, there are laboratories where I have seen equipments in 
microscopy worth 15 lakhs, but in the simple bench microscope of 40x was not functional. Agreed, agreed, agreed. It is I money makes it, money makes the mare go. Simple as that. And remember, in an embryology lab, the higher the gadgetry doesn't mean that toppering your results. It may be the other way around. You got <laughs> You're losing point. the skills. Uh -huh, absolutely. Basically. See, this is what happened even in the college level also. If you go to see, people have forgotten, you know, like say exactly how the things to be done. And what is the principle behind that? Today, everything ready-made is available, no? Yes, sir. Sir, I tell you, when I started in the year 1991 or 92, I was first made to wash glassware and washing a glassware of embryology is what takes a five-day procedure. So I was thinking embryology you know? <laughs> it is like chromic acid, distilled water, this. Then what happened? Disposables, media ready made, taka tak. And in doing that, we became lethargic. Quality control went for a toss. What, what you said, point? you know, today when I say see this pandemic situation and the things happening, and like you in 1978 when viruses when I was growing the same yes sir similar not the COVID but the same paramyxo virus and the same thing meaning is today's vaccination trials all those things but that it was so expensive to grow and if you have bottle you know the glass bottle because everything has to be washed mm -hmm. like your disposable needles were not available sir absolutely so we had to sterilize every needle and every needle has to be like not blood. So before sterilization, you test it and then do it. And that is all from the nail. We used to see those aluminum boxes. They used to be kept in the water boilers for 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah. So, so like they, they think it's like ancient thing, you know. But they don't understand that what you all learn from that. But the precision and the meticulousness in those times was much more better than what it is today. Because we have become lethargic. We have become complacent. Anyway, sir, thank you very much. Thanks for having oh, thank, me. We okay. must thank you for doing Amazing. this wonderful thing. Excellent, excellent. I think they have to give the vote of thanks. So, Shruti is waiting. See, she is nodding. She can't leave you like that. Achha, okay. <laughs> okay. So, before we come to an end, like, I mean, uh, we have Adelia who would just summarize whatever happened throughout the entirety of the day, everything that we learned and so forth. So, Adelia, can you? Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, so a very good evening to one and all present here. I would firstly like to thank uh, Dr. Karsi Avari for sharing his experiences and knowledge with us today on the topic infertility and enigma. Through your presentation today, we got to learn a lot about infertility, the various causes and treatments of infertility in males and females, the various assisted reproductive technologies and OPU proced uh, procedures, equipments that were used. Also, we uh, studied the importance of hormones in our body. Uh, we also did a comparison in, all, in the various te uh, assisted reproductive techniques. We then moved on to the virtual tool, which was my favorite part of the entire session, because it helped us gain more insights of how things actually work in the lab and what are the challenges faced by the embryologists. We started off by studying the uh, basic structure of modular labs and why is it important to maintain a circular circulating airflow and uh, the uh, importance of a clean and well-maintained workstation. We uh, then uh, studied the way how the various equipments work and how different procedures are carried out systematically. All the videos were very precise and well explained by you, sir. It was overall a very interesting and interactive session, and I would love to be a part of more such sessions in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being so patient with me. Okay. So till we meet day after tomorrow morning, good day. Good evening to you, sir. See you day after. Thank you very much. So I'd like to present the vote of thanks. Uh, Heba will be doing that. Although like thanks is not enough for all that you've helped us with. It's still just a little vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. Um, it gives me an Im immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for this event to all the dignitaries assembled here. Firstly, I would like to thank our guest speaker, Dr. K.C. Avari, who honored us with his inspirational thoughts. 
the need to address infertility stems from the consequences it entails on a personal as well as a socio economic level and this session allowed us to gain a better understanding regarding the same it has been a very fruitful and a fruitful event and i'm really glad to announce that we have another day full of learning to gain so thank you so again sir for sharing such valuable information with us i would also like to thank our beloved principal dr ashok wadia and the department of life sciences who gave us this wonderful wonderful opportunity and last but not the least the amazing audience for making this webinar a grand success once again i thank one and all present here please join us again on this amazing virtual journey on the 26th and let's open new doors of learning about art thank you thank you very much good evening have a good day ahead of you thank you sir bye bye bye